I would like to call the Prince William County School Board meeting to order. A motion is in order for the approval of the closed session agenda. Ms. Jesse. I move that the Prince William County School I move that the Prince William County School Board approve the closed session agenda as recommended. Do I have Mr. a second? Chairman. Ms. Ralston. I second. Discussion. Please vote. If you sit down, you're part of it. Who seconded it? Ralston. We are bearing. We just vote by hand. So we're gonna we're gonna go ahead and vote by hand. Any opposed to entering closed session? I don't see any. Yay! Vote yes. Okay, so we're good. Um, and we're moving on to the motion to enter closed session. The motion's in order. Mr. Chairman. Ms. Jesse. I move that pursuant to Virginia Code 2.2, Code Virginia 2.2-3711, the Prince William County School Board in a closed session for the following reasons. One, to discuss and consider the assignment, appointment, performance discipline, and salary adjustments of specific personnel, uh, specific employees, appointments, appointees, or officers to the Prince William County School Board under codes 2.2-3711A1 and H. Two, to discuss legal counsel and take action to the disciplinary appeal of a specific student under Virginia codes 2.2-3711A2 and H3 to discuss the acquisition of real property for, a public, for public, a public purpose and the investment of public funds where bargaining is involved and where a discussion in an open meeting would adversely affect the bargaining position, negotiating strategy and financial interests of the school board under Virginia codes 2.2-3711A, 3, and 6. Four, to consult with the division council and receive legal advice regarding actual and probable litigation where the, such consultation and briefing in open session would adversely affect the negotiating or litigating posture of the school board under Virginia Codes 2.2-3711, A7, and 5. To discuss the performance of division council and legal matters handled by the Office of Division Council and to consider amendment of the division council's contract of under Virginia Codes 2.2. 2-3711A1 and H. Do I have a second? Second. Ms. Ralston, second. All in favor of moving to closed session, say aye. Any opposed? No. The Prince William County School Board will now enter closed session, return open session in approximately one hour. Sorry. Okay, the Prince William County School Board is now returning to open session from closed session. I need a motion from another board member on the recommended closed session action item. Mr. Chairman, I move that Prince William County School Board approve an amendment to Division Council's employment agreement and further the school board authorize the Chairman at Large to execute the same on behalf of the school board. Thank you, Mr. Deutsch. Do I have a second? Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman I'll second. Mr. 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 Yeah. Chenum, thank you. Okay. Let's vote.
The vote is six yes, one abstention, one not present vote. Motion passed. Thank you. Uh, moving on to the adoption of the closed session consent agenda. I uh, need. Oh. Mr. Chairman, I move that Prince William County School Board approve the closed session consent agenda as recommended. Thank you, Mr. Deutsch. Do I have a second? Second. Ms. Williams, thank you. Any discussion? Great. Let's vote. Vote is seven yes, one not present vote. Motion passed. Thank you. Moving on, number 10, closed session certification. Do I have a motion for? Mr. Mr. Chairman, I move that pursuant to Virginia Code 2.2-3712, closed session of the Princeton County School Board meeting of June 5th, 2019, be certified by adopting the following resolution. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Princeton County School Board hereby certifies that to the best of each member's knowledge, one only public business matters lawfully exempted from open meeting requirements were discussed in the closed session to which the certification resolution applies. And two, only such public business matters as were identified in the motion convened in closed session meeting were heard and discussed or considered by the school board. Mr. Chairman? Yes, Ms. Williams. I second. Thank you. Any discussion? Nope. Okay, please vote. The vote is seven yes, one not present vote. Motion passed. Thank you. Before we start with the presentations, I do apologize. I know all your time is valuable. You have a lot of some kids, students, teachers, and stuff like that. So we did go a little over in the closed session. So I just want to apologize for that. We had a lot of items on the agenda. Moving to the presentations, business partnership award. So the Prince William County School Board and our superintendent of schools will present awards recognizing our business partnership award winners. I apologize, there's more of this Dr. Latif script. Uh, these awards were created to recognize best practices in school to business community partnerships, everyone's like dot, 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 that have significantly improved <laughs> academic achievement and or work readiness skills for students of our schools. The following partnerships are recognized this year as the business partnerships of the year. We're gonna start Crop Metcalf and the PWCS Office of Career and Technical Education. in between, yes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you all. The Lynx Incorporated Old Dominion Virginia Chapter and Miniville Elementary School. Okay, Crossroads Connection and Tyler Elementary School. And the Sharon Henry Partner in Education, Bubble Salon, and Ashland Elementary School. Thank 
doctor talked to I would just leave it. it, it nobody knows no, the difference. No, no, no. Do we want to? It, Are you, if we could ask the business partners to all come up to the front for a quick photo with the board, we'd appreciate it. Thank you. So we want to thank, on behalf of our entire school board, Dr. Waltz and our administrative team, we want to thank more than our 1,000 business partners, community partners, for what they do, for our student staff, and once again, a special congratulations to all of our partners. You truly make a difference in the education of our students and demonstrate excellent schools are everyone's business. So thank you. Okay, positively PWCS. So we are kicking off the business of our meetings with a response to community requests to hear more about good things that our schools, students, and staff members are accomplishing. accomplishing. Tonight's positively PWCS presentation spotlights many state champions at Woodbridge High School. Our lovely Miss Lily Jesse of the Occoquan District will introduce her and our presentation tonight. Well, Woodbridge is in the house. Well, as you know, I brought the, the football team into the boardroom. And, you know, it's wonderful to have a girls team in this, in this boardroom. So I want to, to, to well, I'm thrilled to introduce, these are all state winners at Woodbridge High. So, first of all, Ms. Abney, you rock. You are doing a wonderful job. But, so we have state winners in girls basketball, creative writing, wrestling, track, and crew from Woodbridge High are here to be honored. It's my pleasure to introduce Principal Heather Abney and Retiring Director of Student Services, Mr. Washington, is he here tonight? <laughs> Who will introduce our students and honorees and show a feature video. Yep. Thank you, and, and thank you again for having us. Um, it's truly a pleasure to be here. I wanna thank Dr. Waltz and all the members of the school board. Uh, we've come full circle here with Mr. Washington. Um, as you just heard Ms. Jesse mention, Mr. Washington is retiring at the end of this school year. And I just want to take a minute to just um, brief you on his story. Uh, our head coach, Tamika Dudley, played for Mr. Washington. She went off to college. She came back and served as Mr. Washington's assistant. Um, there was 
um, a time, was it 2010, Mr. Washington? Or 11? Was it 2010? With the, yes. the, in 2010, Mr. Washington collapsed on the basketball court. He had a heart attack. His heart stopped. Coach Dudley saved his life. Wow. Um, so it's, it's quite a story. Um, and to come full circle for our girls basketball team to win the state championship for the first time in our school's history on, in the year that, that Mr. Washington is retiring is just uh, truly a blessing. So we want to thank you for having us. And as you mentioned, uh, creative writing, state champions for creative writing. Um, Mrs. Haley, our creative writing teacher, is retiring after 40 years this year. So it's, it's truly an honor that she's able to have a state championship as well. Um, our ninth graders on our crew team are the ones that won the state championship for crew. And then Laura Webb, who, graduates, who graduated last week, won two state championships for track. So we're really excited for her. And in addition to our girls basketball team, we have Seth Ellsmore here, if Seth could stand up. Seth, yeah, Seth won the state championship for wrestling. So I would like the girls to come up because I thought, what would Dr. Waltz do? Uh, what would the goat do? What would the king do? He would buy them all state championship rings, and that's exactly what we did. So tonight they have their rings in the boxes, and we'd like them to come up and put their rings on for all of you. And then Mr. Washington uh, would just like to say a few words as well. So if you all, if you girls could come up, and let's go ahead and put the rings on. Let's get our fabulous Woodbridge School Board member up there with you guys, Miss Jessie. I'm sorry, Akakwan. Yes, would the rest of the board quickly go up there and take a picture with the team? Thank you, Doctor. 
All right, that's for you. Have fun. Thank you. Um, before we show the video, uh, Mr. Washington and I just wanted to thank Dr. Waltz and the school board uh, for all the renovations that Woodbridge has received um, over this last year and the renovations that are to come. Um, big round of applause for you for that. So um, I want to let Mr. Washington, he wanted to, to speak a little bit about how grateful we are for everything. Yeah, I wanted to take this opportunity to thank you so much. Dr. Walsh, school board. You know, I've been at Woodbridge for uh, a long time. And this, you know, it, it hits me here. You know, it, it really does. You know, we, uh, we went without for a while, you know, and I'm so glad that y'all were able to take care of us. Um, you know, the girls, even though there's a few that'll be graduating next year, there was two that graduated this year. Um, they all come back, and I know that they will appreciate what we will have. Our, our field, uh, two gym floors, the, the, the uh, weight room. It's, yo, know, you have no idea what you've done for us. I just want to thank you again. And as we close, we would just like to show a clip uh, from our pep rally, and we're going to see if you all recognize the mascot. <laughs> In closing, I, I want to thank all of you, and I want to thank Mr. Washington in particular because it was Mr. Washington and also uh, Ms. Abney who took me on that tour of the building, and uh, Mr. Wortham who took me on the field and said, let's look at the field, and Mr. Washington in particular, I think, he, he knew that there were things that need to be done at that building. And at this time, I also want to thank the parents who care, parents, from, uh, parents who care from Woodbridge High. I think you're in the room. Could you please stand? These ladies. Thank you. One of the reasons that you're getting, one of the reasons you're getting those, those fields and everything, they came in this board, they're here every night. I think every time we have a meeting. But these are the people, when we work together, we, we can do things. So thank you very, very much. I'm honored to be your school board member, representative. Thank you. And ladies and gentlemen, you may leave because we're gonna be here a long time. Thank you very much. Thank you.
I would like to call this meeting the Prince William County School Board in order. There will be a moment of silence at the request of Ms. Satterwhite of the Gainesville District. Thank you. Uh, the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, do we have any students who would like to come forward and lead us in the pledge? I know we just dismissed a bunch of them. <laughs> oh, yeah, come on, guys. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> you gotta lower that mic. Oh, well, good, we got a good bundle. Good. I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I am Matthew Urbaniak and I go to Coles Elementary. I am Aiden Nicely, and I go to Coles Elementary. I am Bryce Moore, and I go to Coles Elementary. I am Tyler Yako, and I go to Victory Elementary. I am Anya Parasom, and I go to Victory Elementary. <laughs> okay. Let's move forward with the uh, approval of Chairman? the public meeting agenda. A motion is in order. Mr. Chairman, I Ms. move Williams. that the Prince William County School Board approve the public meeting agenda as recommended. Do I have a second? Mr. Chairman. Ms. Oh. Ralston. I second. Any discussion? Okay, let's vote, please. The vote is seven yes, one not present at vote. Motion passed. Thank you. Moving on to the adoption of the consent agenda. A motion is in order. Mr. Chairman. Ms. Williams. I move that the Prince William County School Board approve the public meeting consent agenda as recommended. Thank you. Do I have a second? Mr. Chairman. Ms. Ralston. I second. Thank you. Any discussion? Please vote. The vote is seven yes, one not present at vote. Motion passed. Thank you. Moving on, the next item is the student representative who just graduated, <laughs> including also the alternates. So they will be at the next meeting? Okay. Okay, great. Okay, <laughs> moving on then to uh, 17. I'm gonna make Mr. Deutsch, I'm gonna like, do you wanna make the recommendation of, well, with, you, with the time and the number, I was wondering with unanimous consent if we can move the SEAC committee presentation ahead of this just because of the length of time and the parents of that group. Do we have any objection to that? We have a presentation, the committee of made up of parents representing each district for this annual special education report. And given the number of people we just, I think it would be possible if the board would agree with me to move them ahead of this quickly so they can make their presentation and then we'd move on to citizen comment time. Is there any objection? No. Okay, so we are quickly going to have our SEAC group, Special Education Advisory Annual Report. It's number 19. No. Ms. Goss and committee. Oh, 
So good evening. Good evening. Vice, <laughs> Vice Chairman Wilk, school board members, and Dr. Waltz. Tonight, the outstanding chairman for our Special Education Advisory Council, otherwise known as SEAC, Justin Karen, will be presenting to you the annual SEAC report. This report contains the collaborative accomplishments of SEAC and the Office of Special Education, along with some recommendations for next year's work together. I would like to take this opportunity to honor Mr. Karen and all our SEAC members, as well as the parents and community members who attend the meetings each month. I also want to recognize Dr. Roper and the caring and thoughtful way that she listens to feedback and leads her team to respond to concerns. Her collaboration with SEAC, as well as our families and schools, has been a difference maker. The Office of Special Education and SEAC have a positive partnership devoted to continuously improving our services and support to students with disabilities and their families. At this time, I'm excited to introduce and welcome to the podium the chairman of SEAC, Mr. Justin Karen. Thank you, Ms. Goss, members of the school board, Dr. Waltz. I'm assuming this is the clicker. Uh, my name is Justin Karen, chairman of SEAC, as she, she had mentioned. Uh, I'll start off with saying this is my last presentation to you all. Uh, we are very glad to have elected Ms. Cindy Buckley as chair for the next school year, uh, Ms. Yukiko Dove as vice chair, and Christy Young as secretary. Uh, I'll remain on the committee for another school, uh, school year, uh, but I'll be coming off on 2020. So, yes, sir. I want to make sure we Thank hear you. your important words. Appreciate it. Uh, this year's SEAC report is an accurate reflection of the committee's interactions with our constituents, partners in the community, uh, serving special needs students in the Office of Special Education. Herein, we provide you all, uh, the Office of Special Education, the community, a highlight of our accomplishments from this past school year and recommendations for the 2019-2020 school year. Our goal, of course, is to partner with the school board directly uh, with you to continue to make improvements in the lives of students with special needs in Prince William County Schools. So we'll start with sort of accomplishments against the goals we stated last year. So what have we done against those, the progress? And then we'll go into recommendations for next year. So directly from the report in 2017-2018, for Independence Non-Traditional School, we really asked that appropriate funding and sort of attention was paid uh, for the opening of that, that uh, facility. And the progress directly from staff, Independence Non-Traditional School opened successfully with required funding and staff in place. Second was increasing school administrators' working knowledge of individualized education programs, or IEPs in Section 4s, Section 504s, similarities and differences, uh, as well as the legal requirements. Uh, a detailed explanation of these two options from a student and parent perspective should be provided by PWCS and distributed in a variety of ways. So the progress, uh, training in differences between both the 504 and the IEP process has occurred for staff who supervise special education, as well as those uh, through events such as Parents as Partners, the Parent Resource Center, and the Circle of Support. A more detailed and specific explanation of eligibility meeting process uh, should be created and distributed to parents and students in multiple languages prior to eligibility meetings taking place. And this one was really adopted by all of us. And what does this mean in simple terms? An orientation to special education for new parents, uh, children, new children, new parents. So the result here, we're, we're very happy about this one, parents as partners. It's a packet of information, an orientation packet. It's under development. It'll be distributed at the beginning of fall 2019. The packet's gonna contain information to assist parents with the journey through special education. It will include eligibility information as well as many other topics and resources, in addition to the rights and responsibilities from the Virginia DOE. Uh, as a technicality, the removal of site tours from SEAC's responsibility, we removed references of site tours both on the bylaws as well as the website. Uh, most importantly, in my opinion, the completion of a thorough review, discussion, consideration of the 2017-2018 OSE external audit. Within the report we provided, 15 or so pages, there's a bit of an explanation. Uh, and I believe uh, Mr. Latif attended the meeting. It was the first or second SEAC session of, of this, this past school year. 
uh, Dr. Roper had put up each of the recommendations, and we pr prioritized those recommendations as members of the committee, saying these are most important to us. Uh, so it was a direct meeting dedicated to the results of that, that audit and some recommendations there. More details in the report. It's recommended that OSC continue to address staffing in order to ensure that PWCS remains in compliance to develop long-term plans to try to stay ahead of the growth within the county and increase the number of students requiring special needs services. This is a direct call out to a, a staff shortage that was taking place in the last school year. Progress there, regularly scheduled meetings occur between OSC and the Office of Finance to ensure compliance with special education staffing requirements. Moving on, adoption of identified improvements to the current site-based management methodology. You'll remember uh, uh, in last year's report, there was a, a fairly long portion dedicated to site-based management where we had a number of staff attend meetings with us and kind of walk through, take questions from SEAC members, very graciously answering those questions for us. Um, continuing there, there was a presentation at the beginning of this year to address site-based management where Keith Inman uh, and Ms. Goss, as well as other level associates, participated in a site-based management discussion. Site-based management is, again, one of the recommendations for this 2019-2020 school year as well, so more on that in a few slides. So for 2019-2020, the recommendations, regular updates uh, from the superintendent, Dr. Waltz, and the director of special education, Ms. Ms. Roper, on the progress made on audit recommendations. I purposely did not quantify regular, biannual, quarterly, uh, regular updates, you know, what progress have we made? Where are we? Is the funding in place? That's kind of on you guys for the funding piece. Prioritize the funding needed for OSE to implement the recommended modifications and improvements. Um, you know, it's, it's good to have an update, but if we don't have the money to implement those changes, we're, we're kind of... Uh, prioritize funding to secure additional licenses of TeachTown, which is an application described in that report we provided as well. Uh, and additional components of that software enabling further implementation of the application within special education student population. Uh, there was a pilot program launched this year, received very positively, uh, all signs point to go. Continue to ensure implementation and adoption of the 2017, I'll skip all those words, funding and uh, audit recommendations for assistive technology directly. Uh, this is one where I think we're fully staffed now in assistive technology and the definition of fully staffed is I believe two employees for the county. 100% increase in staff for assistive technology. So in a perfect world, assistive technology is iPads for everybody. Uh, you know, there's a budget required for that. This is probably one of the more complicated ones. Graduation requirement update trainings continue to be offered by school division. We, we had a presentation uh, by a very knowledgeable staff member against what those new graduation requirements are in a special education setting. So this is a call out to providing more of an in-depth explanation to parents and students who are pursuing those diplomas so that there's a full understanding of the paths that they're selecting and what the requirements are of those paths. Uh, and when our last meeting and presentation was with the Prince William County Parks and Recreation, uh, we're, we're hoping for a bit of a collaboration and partnership as a means to provide potential after-school adapted activities for students, field trips to parks and recreations locations, geared towards those with special needs and potential therapeutic summer camp programs. This is a, a, a lack or a need in Prince William County for families. Continued training of special education teachers, teachers in the Orton-Gillingham method with opportunities for follow-up and increased opportunities for teachers to attend the Make It to Take It workshop that supplies necessary materials. More training about the nature and impact of dyslexia, uh, deficits in the phonological processing and the most beneficial strategies. Encourage collaboration between reading specialists and special education teachers, including opportunities for training workshops to develop best practices in reading instruction. And that is it. I'd like to express our gratitude to the following PWCS staff, personnel, and community partners and their time for their time and support. The Office of Special Education, Dr. Roper, thank you. And of course, Mary Jo Flood. Uh, the ship sinks without her emails and reminders of deadlines and things that are due. Cindy Carmina, Assistive Technology Coordinator, Rebecca Yellett, Supervisor, Rebecca uh, Slater, Supervisor of Secondary Counseling and Student Support Services, Ms. Rhonda Tabor, Parent Resource Center, my left or my right, there she is, uh, previous Chair of SEAC, consultant with SEAC this year, uh, we would not have had two successful years without her continued support and participation, uh, Parent Coordinator with, with PRC, and of course, Ms. Goss, Student Learning and Accountability. 
And a special call out to the Prince William County Parks and Recreation team, Tracy Hannigan, Deputy Director, and Veronica Lofman, their newly appointed ADA coordinator. And that is it. Ms. Williams? Um, as always, and since I've been up here, special education is near and dear to my heart, and I um, just want to commend all of you who serve on this committee. It is a huge undertaking every single year. Um, since serving on this board, I cannot think of anything that changes more and more often, especially with regards to laws and regulations and technology and just the expansion simply of special education and what that means. Is, uh, is a huge daunting undertaking in the time that you take out of your lives to help all of us better understand your experience, um, especially with um, you know, your undertaking, as you said, having um, outside um, personnel come in and really answer questions. Um, your, your collaborative nature is just absolutely amazing to me. And I just wanted to thank you from the bottom of my heart. Um, I am so pleased to see some of these recommendations on here. Um, the reading, the collaboration between the reading specialists and the special education teachers to me is huge. There's a lot of students that have IEPs that um, I think your average parent would not consider a special education student just upon appearance or based upon the classes they take, but reading comprehension is a major, major repetitive issue constantly. And it just absolutely deserves some more time and attention. And I'm so glad that that was one of your recommendations. Um, I just, I have no words really more to say thank you because it's it's a labor of love. And Ms. Roper, um, also just thank you for uh, undertaking your position. The change that you have made since um, taking on your position and your interaction with staff and parents and the SEAC committee is definitely noticed and appreciate it. Um, I, I don't think you guys ever have an easy job because it's never done. And there's always someone that's gonna come and complain um, and say, my kid hasn't been, or there isn't enough service, um, but you continue to make that upward climb and it just deserves all the credit in the world. So thank you very much. You know, I've... <clears throat> I've done these committee members a disservice if we could kind of have them stand up and, and be recognized. They, they attend every month, even though I, I may or may not remind them, but if you guys could stand very quickly. Thank you for coming out to this group. Ms. Satterwhite. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. Um, Mr. Caron, am I pronouncing it correctly? Karen. Karen, okay, that's the same as my sister's. Um, thank you so much for your service to SEAC. I remember the report that we had, I wanna say it was last year, was very different from this report. And this is the most encouraging report I can remember getting from SEAC, and that's exciting. Um, so thank you all for your hard work. Um, thank you for the collaboration. Um, Dr. Roper with, Department of, with um, our Office of Special Education. I'm thrilled with what I'm hearing and seeing from you, the Parents as Partners Packet. I love the title and I love the concept and that's something that a lot of us have talked about, that we need to give parents the information up front, a resource. And I know I said to Dr. Waltz when I first came on the board that we have to partner with our parents with special, who have children in special education because they deal with so much at home anyway and we need to be working with them. And I, am, I cannot tell you how thrilled I am with where we are now and the potential and where we're going. I know it's gonna be a challenge to the Office of Special Education to keep up with professional development and training, but we're doing it. Um, I was very happy to see the mention of Orton Gillingham and um, continuing to work on dyslexia because that's something that's been an expressed um, concern from many, many parents. And um, I am very, very happy that also in this budget we just passed that we are funding the special education audit recommendations. And you challenged us on that last year too. You challenged us to make sure that we follow out with the special education audit plan. And that's something that we are definitely watching carefully and we definitely bother Dr. Waltz with questions on that on a regular basis. Um, so thank you very much. And I also wanna thank uh, Ms. Cindy Buckley, my representative on the board. Um, Ms. Buckley, I recommend, I, I, 
thank you for um, being our chairman next year and look forward to hearing from you later. And uh, thank you all very, very much for your time and dedication to SEAC. Mr. Deutsch, did you have something? I'm sorry. Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, just wanted to thank everybody on the committee uh, for your incredible work. Uh, this audit is really exciting, and I think this year has been a lot of great work as a result of that audit. Uh, and thank you for your work uh, making sure a lot of things happen. I uh, want to thank Sarah Pitkin uh, for her work on the committee uh, and for her involvement. Uh, also, just want to give another shout out uh, to Michelle Roper. Um, you know, we've done, I think, a lot this last budget cycle in terms of additional technology, um, additional staffing resources, but also I think some of the um, senior additions um, to what we're doing on special education will continue to help, whether it's Michelle Roper, uh, Denise Hebner's new position, her involvement, we're really excited about that in the coming year. Uh, adding an additional attorney to help being proactive and supportive of parents. Um, just a number of, um, of steps that we've taken. And so um, I think this year um, is kind of a capstone and, of, and a launching spot for after a lot of uh, really good work we've put in place over the last few years. So thank you all so much. Miss, <laughs> Miss Jesse. Uh, I also want to thank you. My background is in special ed and I came into special ed before it was considered really special because kids were institutionalized and we have really come a long way. And I think about those parents who had those kids at home, I really don't know how they managed. I also, uh, in board matters, I just wanna bring an activity that I observed at, um, when, at Antietam Elementary and Ms. Hebner was there with me. It was a phenomenal project where they reversed, they role play and they had reversed uh, the roles of special education kids with regular kids. So uh, they would have, a, uh, you would go to different centers and if you, they would have sunglasses so that you could see what it felt like to be blind. Uh, they had sensory kinds of things. I think the one activity that stuck with me was the kids, they had a wheelchair center and regular kids had to get in wheelchairs and manage uh, the wheelchairs. And you would think that a child would say, this is very difficult, but the child said, this is embarrassing. And so she, they're saying, wow, this is really different. I have to get help. And that's how some kids really feel. And I think what they did at Antietam was a way to make all the kids know what it's like so that children don't feel that it is embarrassing to have a, a special needs. So I want to thank you for all the work that you've done. Thank you very much. Mr. Trenum. Thank you, Mr. Wilk. Uh, Mr. Karen, thanks for the presentation. I want to echo Ms. Satterwhite's uh, comments as far as I think this is the best one that we've had in, in the years that I've been here as far as uh, being from a positive outlook. Um, I think we made a lot of progress this last year with the budget seat, uh, session. Um, I, would, I would guess, it's not in your charter, but I would add a charge to the, to the uh, SEAC as we go forward next year's budget season. Part of your responsibilities is to hold us accountable to make sure that we continue uh, on this trajectory. Um, and then the last thing I want to do is just a public service announcement. The Brentsville seat is vacant right now. The previous representative had to resign. So if anybody out there who is a Brentsville resident or works in a Brentsville school or whatever is interested, by all means, let me know. Thank you. Ms. Ralston, do you want to? Yeah, just quickly, I just want to say thank you. It's not about what we actually do sitting up here. You're in the midst of the big circle as far as I'm concerned. And I want you to know that for many years, I played a part, a small part, for special ed. Um, when you start out, you cry a lot. And then things get better, and you know the child is learning. So thank you very much. I'll I'll finish real quick, and, and thank you, Mr. Karen, the entire group. I think I've said this before, and um, for those of you who don't know, uh, my seven-year-old, my son, Dominic, my oldest, is uh, nonverbal on the autism spectrum. Um, we had him diagnosed at two and a half um, uh, as uh, on the spectrum. We chose to do that versus a severe speech delay for expansion of services and support. Um, it's a lot. Um, it's a lot. And progress 
Sometimes it feels it's taking a long time, but when you're in there day to day, you, sometimes you don't see um, what is happening. Um, and, and the work that this committee, um, our special ed department with Dr. Roper and your team, I just think it, in the last year plus, it's been entire culture chains of transparency, communication, dialogue, expansion of support. We've provided the additional funding from you know talking to teachers when I visit and do, and I like to be in my classrooms, and I do make it a point in each of my schools usually to stop by one of the contained uh, rooms if they have any of them or any of the immersion cl classes as well. But I know teachers are very appreciative of Teach Town. I know the assistive technology, which my son does use, um, is making big progress. Little steps from just pointing ball to I want ball, I want ball now. Um, but it's working and I can know it's working for kids all over and that's an amazing expansion. The audit recommendations, having those and funding those. The community events that we've had um, and I know we're doing more. We had it this year um, at Hampton. I know we're talking about doing one next year. Uh, the expansion of our parent resource center hours, another major uh, improvement. You know, not all families are able to take time off during the day, so making sure we have support and hopefully adding more uh, of that for uh, you know parents and families, especially working families. Site-based management, you know, that's always, you know, working with our principals and stuff like that. I was happy to see the Orton Gillingham training. Um, that was a big thing I pushed, and I'm not taking full credit for that. I do want to recognize a parent in my district, Miss Brandy Workman, um, if she's watching or not, but very passionate parent who pushed me to learn more about dyslexia and the training with phonics and speech. Um, and um, that has been a major push, so I want to thank her for that because um, that definitely educated me and pushed me in that direction to really make sure that recommendation was part of this in discussion. Um, but long story short, thank you all for your service. Uh, Yukiku, it's nice to see you. Um, <laughs> I love, she's in my district, um, and she may not be my appointee, but she knows she can come to me, and it's fun. I, I appreciate when parents from all over the county reach out to me. Uh, I am honored by that because I have gone through the IEP process many times. We have speech, we have occupational therapy, we have ABA therapy, and, and my wife who lets me have this opportunity to serve on this board uh, and who does probably three-fourths of the work with my son. Uh, she's a blessing and a saint, um, and um, I just thank her for that, and I thank all special needs parents out there for all the hard work and the feedback you've provided, so thank you. <laughs> Dr. Waltz. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your uh, excellent report, Mr. Karen, and I just want to uh, echo, I appreciate all of you who are volunteering on SEAC, and thank you for caring enough to give so much of your personal time for something as important as this. Uh, Dr. Roper, Ms. Goss, thank you for all that you're doing. We are very, very excited because, you know, we went through 10 years of a great recession, and uh, it's amazing what you can do with money. Um, but we actually found some money in the middle of this year, so we advanced that second assistive technology uh, position. And uh, if any of you are on Twitter, you can kind of see what I'm doing day to day. But I've been in three classrooms uh, just in the last month that have demonstrated the assistive technology. And it's great being out in the classrooms because you can ask the people actually doing the work, you know, like, did you hear about the second position in assistive technology? Oh, yeah, they've been out to my classroom. Were they able to actually help you? Oh, yeah, they were great. So we know it's working, and it, it's great to have a second person. And, uh, you know, it's always great to be in those classrooms and hear the teachers talk about the breakthroughs that have happened as a result of that assistive technology and many, many other things. But uh, thank you again. I appreciate all that you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Miss. Ms. Williams, last, we're going to finish it off. Thank oh, yeah. Okay. I, I didn't want to do interrupt the thank yous because it's well-deserved and take time. Um, I wondered if you consider for next year maybe some sort of uh, discussion, starting a discussion on um, talking with our, our classroom teachers, not just our special education teachers, but our, our teachers everywhere throughout the building um, about having special education students in their classroom because we know that that's an increasing um, 
an increasing task and they may not be as familiar with what to do or how to deal with or how to talk to a special education student. And I think that's a very vital component as we see those that uptick. And then um, I love the graduation requirement update and one ask and that is just to include that now colleges and universities recognize IEPs. And I think a lot of parents, because sometimes parents of special education students were special education, a, a lot of them sort of um, stop before they get started and thinking about their child going to college, not knowing that that is now something that continues on past high school. And it may be just that one little extra push to encourage that parent or even that student to continue their education. And um, again, I just wanted to thank you for, for everything that you've done. Thank you so much. Thank you, Siak. Appreciate it. Thank you, guys. OK, thank you. And I appreciate those who have spoken, uh, signed up for citizen comment time for being patient. Um, we are moving on to citizen comment time on our agenda. It looks like we had 22 people who signed up in advance and seven people that signed up at the door. Everyone that signed up in advance will have a chance to speak. Um, given that everyone waited, if there's any objection, I think it's chairman prerogative, but I think we're gonna go through, if everyone's okay, all speakers up front. We'll just go through the whole list tonight instead of making uh, people wait after 30 minutes for later on tonight. So we're gonna go through the whole list of speakers. Um, I'm gonna call the first 10 names and ask you to take a seat in the front row. Uh, Charles Ronco, Megan Link, Jennifer Roberts, Brian Belke, Sharon Hayden, Tony Di Pasquale, Catherine Jones, Christine Yuntz, Curtis Vaughn, and Eddie Rutz, first 10 speakers. You will have three minutes to speak, and the clerk will keep time. The lights on the monitor will indicate your progress. The yellow light will signify that you should sum up your position. Red indicates your time is up, and you should stop. Please use proper decorum and manners while at the podium. If you do not use so, you will be asked to step aside. Please give your name and your address for the record when you approach the podium. Our first speaker is Charles Ronco. Good evening, Chairman Wilk, members of the school board, Dr. Waltz. My name is Chuck Ronco, and my address is on file with Ms. Urban. As we all know, the zoning issue surrounding the 13th high school has been a contentious and lively debate, to say the least. At this point, there are two basic concerns coming from two groups, the parents of the Victory Lake students and the Stonewall Jackson School community. As we currently sit in this debate, there are three plans. Two are up for public comment tonight, and a third that will be debated when th with the others in two weeks. None of these plans involve Victory Lakes going to any other school than Patriot. That means that one community has had their concerns alleviated. No matter what plan is adopted, they will get what they want, and that's fine, because this is not about one community against each other. But now that the concerns of one community have been addressed, it's time for the needs of the other to be given the attention that it deserves. The Stonewall community has, during this entire conversation, call, been calling for one thing, balance. I met with Dr. Cardlidge for two hours, two and a half hours, and shuffled boundaries in an experience that I can only liken to a complex game of chess <laughs> to design a plan to address our concerns. And for those of you who don't know, I play a lot of chess. The result was plan two. The problem with plan two is that it doesn't go far enough. When I met with Dr. Cardlidge and his team, OP and Brentsville were off the table. Mr. Trenum has correctly added them as variables in this equation, and with the creation, with the creation of the afore, aforementioned newest plan, I'm hopeful now as this opens up the chessboard to greater possibilities for achieving that balance. This issue comes back to the fact that we have two regulations, sorry, two policies that need to be addressed in the long term. We have a zoning regulation that has to be updated, and we have a transfer process that needs to be updated. This entire issue could have been resolved. Middle and elementary schools use a planning committee based, made of community members. High schools do not because the, plan is, because the committees are supposedly too large and, and difficult to work with. But those regulations, those policies were written before we had a parliamentarian, and we have a parliamentarian. 
So it, we can run committees with larger than 15 people. If we had had a committee made of community members, then we would have had this issue been resolved before it ever got hot and, and angry as it is now. I look forward with doc, to meeting again with Dr. Cardlich to work out the, 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 the specifics of a new plan, one that keeps Victory Lakes going to Patriot and works to balance the numbers to avoid having one rich school and one poor school at either ends of Sudley Manor. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Ronco. <laughs> Ms. L Megan Link. Good evening, Dr. Waltz. Vice Chairman Wilk and members of the school board, my name is Megan Link and my address is on file. In recent weeks, it has become increasingly difficult to hear and read the negative language used to mischaracterize and misrepresent Stonewall Jackson High School. Stonewall is not, as some would have you believe, less than. I have heard these not so covert attacks since arriving in the county more than 20 years ago. To those that now feel that they too are being maligned, I say, welcome to my world. With all due respect to the US News and World Report rankings, presenting isolated statistics to compare a school built in the current decade to one built just shy of 50 years ago paints a narrow, distorted, and incomplete picture. There is no defensible basis upon which to pull out percentages for comparison purposes when the cherry-picked yardstick school bears absolutely no demographic resemblance to the one under scrutiny. This is at the very least unsound, at worst malicious. If individual schools must be judged against each other, do so with schools reporting similar demographics. Better still, look at the stride Stonewall has made over the last decade, measuring it solely against itself. The majority of runners seek only to beat their own personal best. SJ students, their families, and the faculty and staff understand that education is not a sprint, but rather a marathon. The SJ community is in it for the distance. Stonewall was the first in the division to implement the International Baccalaureate Program, comprised of standard and higher level IB courses in a wide variety of areas. This program has been expanded to include the IB Middle Years Program. Also offered Air Force Reserve Officer Training Corps, Cosmetology, Governor's School, Jobs for Virginia Graduates, Teach for Tomorrow and the Origin Project. SJ students have been recognized at the local, regional, state, and national levels, not only for participating in team and individual sports, but for excelling in disciplines as well as extracurricular activities. One of our two qualifying teams recently placed sixth in the national sea perch competition. I will take a breath and switch gears. I thank Dr. Waltz and Mrs. Satterwhite for their attendance at recent Stonewall events. While you each receive copies, Stonewall would like to present each of the other members of the board with a copy of the 2019 Origin Project book. In closing, when a student matriculates at Stonewall, he or she truly becomes one of us. I am exceedingly proud of my students, my colleagues, and my school. To echo a certain Ella student who stood before you last month, I love my school, and I stand with Stonewall. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Link. Ms. Jennifer Roberts. Pause. Good evening. Pause. My name is. Oh. Oh, we'll, hold on, I'm sorry. We'll, I saw the camera. No, no, you're okay. Thank you. Okay, we'll start the clock over for you. Okay, Ms. Roberts, go ahead. Good evening. My name is Jennifer Roberts, and I'm the instructional technology coach at Piney Branch Elementary, and my address is on file. Once again, I'm here to highlight the effort and creativeness of our county's elementary school students in the field of 3D design. This year, we had our second ever. PWCS 3D Design Challenge. Our fourth and fifth grade students were challenged to design creations to solve problems based on the fourth and fifth grade science curriculum. The top designs from each school were printed out on 3D printers, um, and they were chosen to compete against designs from other county schools. And then the top designs from the county were sent on to Tinkercad, and we are um, a 3D design pro program company. And we are waiting for their decision on which design is their favorite. 
This is a winter activity for most schools, so the weather this year did have a bit of an impact on the number of schools and students who participated, but the designs were still quality and some were pretty intricate. We ended up sending three designs to Tinkercad for judging, and we want to applaud the students for their effort. Here are our finalists. From Coles Elementary, we have Aiden Nicely and Matthew Herbaniak. They created a space charging station in Microbot. You can, you can hold it up so they can see it. Uh, the bot fixes technology, specifically computer mainframes in space, and it's assisted by a drill hand and a USB hand. And when it's finished, it floats back to the charging station to charge. They were assisted by their tech club coach, kindergarten teacher, Ramona Richardson. Um, also from Coles Elementary, Bryce Moore created the ROV, or Remote Operated Vehicle. It is made for researching the ocean. It is crafted with propellers for nav navigating deep ocean trenches that are too dangerous for humans with the purpose of taking videos. He was also assisted by Ms. Richardson. And finally, <laughs> from Victory Elementary, Anya Parastram, Sydney Conroy, who's not here, and Tyler Yackel, um, they designed the PackBot. Can you hold that one up? Short for a powerful astronomical cleanup robot that cleans up space debris and returns it to Earth. It's based on the real life Swiss Made, a machine that cleans up space junk. And you can see it's shaped like Pac Man, like Waka Waka. Um, and they even designed a controller for it. So um, they were assisted by their instructional technology coach, Joy Muller, who could not be here tonight. So I just want to say um, thank you for having us here. And also, I'm a Woodbridge Senior High School Class 92 uh, alum. So I want to say, yay, Woodbridge, if you're still here. <laughs> All right. Thank you, guys. Mr. Belke. Good evening, members of the uh, Prince William School Board, and thank you for the chance to talk to you, and thank you for the hard job you have before you. I'm here to address the 13th High School. Uh, my address is on file with a request, but I'm a member of Piedmont South, through the parks at Piedmont, which as a previous speaker said, there's two school communities, but there is a third. We've been vocal at all the community meetings, and our concerns have not been addressed. We are closer to Battlefield High School. We'll be crossing I-66 and I-29 to go to the new 13th High School. Our community is only 230 students, which would keep Battlefield still at 100%. Uh, none of our concerns have been addressed. We have had speakers at both of the community meetings. We have written on the portal. We have brought up issues like the numbers, the balance, crossing I-29. Looking back at the plans that the uh, new commuter lot at University in US 29 that will be up to 3,000 spots was not considered in any of these plans because the state did not let us know it was even going to exist when these plans are drawn up, but that will definitely have an impact. Our students from our community, just for the elementary schools, have been told when the buses are late, stop complaining because we're taking all the buses by employees of Prince William County Schools. But yet, you're going to send our students further, and we're supposed to just accept it because we're taking all the buses. So please do not vote, vote no on Plan 1A or Plan 2 because they have done nothing to address our concerns that have been brought up. Please ask for a third plan that at least looks at this, the communities north of US 29 that would be better served staying in Battlefield and it will actually help the demographics with Battlefield High School and it will not grossly imbalance the uh, attendance the overcrowding which I, I thank the employees of Prince William County Schools. They did a great job on drawing the boundaries, but they answered exactly the task given them. They answered, reduce the overcrowding. But we can also look at the effect this has on the neighborhoods and on busing and on the time our students spend in the commute. Um, so please, when the plans are presented later, you can see they've done nothing for the communities north of US 29 other than just want to bus us further. And that is all I have. Thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. Sharon Hayden. Good evening. My name is Sharon Hayden. My address is on file. I am a resident of Sheffield Manor for the past 15 years. Uh, I'm not here tonight to debate the merits of one school over another. I believe education, you get out of it what you put into it, no matter what school you're at. Um, and I believe that if Prince William County invested resources where resources are needed, every school in Prince William County could be an eight out of 10 on, good school, on great schools for whatever that's worth to who, uh, whoever cares. But you can't do it with the boundaries alone. 
So the reality of tonight is that we have a new school coming and you are tasked with coming up with a boundary or a selecting a boundary for that school. I realize that true feeder patterns for all high schools are not feasible due to the sheer number of students within Prince William County. If the school chooses to select one of the committee's plans, either 1A or 2, I urge you to see the flaws in plan two. It's a plan that isolates our neighborhood as well as independence from other surrounding Bristow communities. It's a plan that sends neighborhoods on Devlin Road, a two mile stretch of, of road to three different high schools. And it, as it currently exists today, the roads, there is no connection of university between Sheffield Manor and Sudley Manor. So it has us going through another school's boundary in order to get to Stonewall Jackson. It's a plan that takes the same kids who will be, in my case, sophomores and freshmen at the new school, if that's where we end up, it takes those same kids who were removed from their peers at Victory Elementary when Chris Young Elementary opened up, and then removes them again from Gainesville Middle School while they're literally watching the new school being built. And I have to admit that following along with the boundary process for this has been a little disappointing. It's disappointing to see neighborhoods and schools pitted against one another. It's disappointing that the planning committee gives the perception of addressing concerns of only some neighborhoods. I realize it's a monumental task that they have to develop these plans. It's disappointing to hear people who are more concerned with the value of their homes than the value of the education that they are getting from Prince William County Schools. And it's disappointing to know that we will likely have to do this all over again when new high schools come in because Prince William County, it's a vicious cycle until Prince William County slows down housing development and allows the school system to catch up. I'd like to thank you for your time this evening. Thank you, Sharon. Tony Di Pasquale. Thank you to the school board here for allowing me the opportunity to speak. My name is Tony Di Pasquale. My address is on file. I represent, as the gentleman previously was, the parks of Piedmont community known here as Piedmont South. Here to talk about the same issues that were raised a moment ago, specifically related to those areas that were highlighted by the planning committee related to the school boundaries. Specifically, Regulation 264.2. These are the six factors that are incorporated when looking at what communities need to go to what schools. They include the balance, the capacity issue we've heard so much about, the demographics, minimizing reassignment, schools, kids being moved from one school to the next, transportation, let's talk about logistics and all those pieces, the avoidance of splitting up individual neighborhoods, and then geographic progression. This is elementary school to middle schools on to high school. Plan A, 1A, Plan 2, both of those two that are speaking, we're speaking to now as my neighbor addressed, do not address those issues for our community. They address one issue and one issue alone. They address capacity. By the planning committee's own numbers, they've indicated that Battlefield will be at 88% capacity in 2027. If our community, which again is two miles away from Battlefield Elementary, Battlefield High School, is able to remain a part of Battlefield, that capacity is 100%. So the current plans do not address demographics. They take the most wealthy, least ethnically diverse, least economically diverse community school in the county and make it even more extreme. They take Battlefield, which had been at 10% economically diverse, cut it down to five. Battlefield, which has been 41% minority, cut it down to 35. Those issues are not rectified with any of these plans. They're actually worsened. Our community isn't gonna fix all those things at once. We're not gonna magically keep our community there and we've solved all those problems. But keeping our community there allows us to address five of those six items that you guys indicated were the primary factors here. They allow us to address the transportation, we're two miles away. They allow us to address the progression, the geographic progression. The two primary school communities at our middle school, Bull Run Middle School, Mountain View, Parks of Piedmont. We flow in to Battlefield High School. They allow us to address 
the reassignment of individuals. These same people, the same sophomores that are gonna be going into the new school, were moved as third graders out of their elementary into a different school. So not the same families, the same neighborhood, it's the exact same children. We were able to address the demographic issues. And again, by the planning committee's own numbers, we're able to address the capacity concerns. All via a plan that doesn't exist yet. Please consider holding Parks at Piedmont at Battlefield High School. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Catherine Jones. Hi, um, I'm not sure I knew I was gonna be like on the big screen, so <laughs> it's a little intimidating. Um, my name is Catherine Jones. I believe my address is on file. Um, I am a resident of Sheffield Manor. I am not here today to quote, speak on behalf of my neighborhood. Um, I am here to speak on behalf of myself and my family and a significant group of other concerned neighbors in Sheffield Manor um, upon the release of Plan 2. Um, I have a Chris Young Elementary fourth grader. I have a Gainesville Middle School sixth grader. Um, both of my kids moved from Victory Elementary to Chris Young. Uh, my daughter was in third grade. They have started over already um, through kind of no fault of their own, we'll say. Um, based on the fact that and I think this is confusing, um, that we have two official plans and then there's sort of a new what if plan that's sort of lurking around and I think there's confusion as to whether that is an actual plan or not. Um, so I can only speak to the two plans that are officially on the table. Um, I, I have to request that you <laughs> approve plan 1A. Um, Plan 1A keeps us at the Sheffield Manor kids at a school relatively nearby our neighborhood. Plan 2 sends us to the furthest possible high school out of three. Um, when future road improvements to university mean that my house, which is at the Devlin Road end of university, would be about two miles from the newer high school. Um, I do understand the need to pull students from Battlefield to go to the, her 13th high school and understand that my fairly small neighborhood just sort of doesn't make the cut. Um, and that's okay, but it's not a justification for pulling one neighborhood out of a group of four that line up along Devlin Road and tell those kids they have to go the furthest distance away. They have to cross 234 uh, bypass one of the most heavily trafficked roads. These are high school kids. They will be crossing that street. Um, it, it kind of defies logic. Uh, I'm an analyst. <laughs> um, but most importantly, Plan 1A keeps our families with the other families and the students that they have grown up with. And high school is hard enough. You start over socially, you know, <sighs> I can ask my kids to make that change if the resulting demographic shift was going to be 10% or even 20%, but a 4% shift to the, to the resulting demographic makeup at Stonewall, that's a lot to ask my kids and 98 other kids that live in Sheffield Manor. Um, so I appreciate you, uh, I'm out of time, <laughs> but I appreciate you listening. Thank you, Ms. Jones. <laughs> Kristen Younts. Good evening. My name is Kristen Yance, and I'm, I've been a resident of Victory Lake for 15 years. I have four children, two in elementary school at Victory Elementary, and two in middle school at Marsteller. <clears throat> First of all, I would like to thank the planning committee for including the rezoning of Victory Lakes to Patriot in all of the plans so far. I know there has been some emotional backlash from other communities over this, but I just wanted to provide my own very simple and practical perspective on this that also reflect those of a num number of my neighbors in Victory Lakes. As mentioned, I have four children, and next year they will be spread over three schools when my oldest begins high school. Currently, our base school is Stonewall Jackson, and while it is only four miles from my home, it is six miles from Marcella Middle School. In contrast, not only is Patriot High School closer to my home at 3.2 miles, it is also only 1.3 miles from my cellar, which is conveniently located between Patriot High and Victory Elementary. 
The order of start and dismissal times line up perfectly, Patriot, then my stellar, and finally victory. Trust me, as a mother of four active and involved children, I can attest that being zoned for Patriot would be far more ideal situation for carpooling and before and after school activities. It would even allow me to be more involved and able to volunteer at multiple schools on a daily basis. I was extremely proud of my daughter when she found out that she was accepted into Patriot's HP Scholars program next year. And I was also tremendously relieved. Even if I drive her or she takes the express bus from Victory Elementary, it will be easier and less time consuming overall for our family as my younger three children will still be at Victory and Mark Zeller for the next several years. So naturally and pragmatically, I am very much in favor of rezoning Victory Lake to Patriot High School so that I can guarantee the same progression for my younger three children. And it is not good just for me. This is also good for many of my neighbors in Victory Lakes. We would all benefit from the improved traffic issues and carpooling situation. Increasing the number of car riders and carpooling while decreasing the number of children being bushed out of our community would also help lessen the strain on our bus transportation system. And of course, creating a situation where parents are closer to the schools and the schools are closer to each other help promote more volunteering, volunteering and PTO involvement. I know demographics is an important consideration, but proximity is first and foremost. Demographic change over the years, proximity rarely does. Victory Lakes has not been rezoned at the high school level in 17 years. It is time to let us go to our community school. This is not an emotional plea. This is just a practical confirmation that rezoning Victory Lakes to Patriot High School is necessary and appropriate. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Jones. You. Curtis Vaughn. Good evening, Dr. Walt, members of the board. Thank you for having us. My name is Kurt Vaughn. My uh, address is on file. First, I'd like to thank the board for providing the opportunity to speak this evening. The boundary issue at hand is not the first matter of debate for residents of Western Prince William County. It won't be the last. My family and I both support plans 1A and 2 that incorporate Victory Lakes into Patriot. I can say as a retired Army service member of 22 years, and I've worked in four different countries and lived in countless places around the world, the planners are doing a very good job and the best they can with managing the influx of residents to our area of Northern Virginia. We are without a doubt congested. When taxpayers in our county talk about quality of life, schedule planning, life events, and in general, an overwhelming majority of them talk about one thing, their commute. We often get up before the sun we carpool, vanpool, take the train, the bus, or any combination thereof to minimize the amount of time on the road. When the workday is done, being able to go home and stay close to community means more time with family. Considering commutes and overall congestion, and most importantly, life outside of work, we chose to live where we live. We happened to choose a home in Victory Lakes. We didn't choose Victory Lakes. After living in the community for three years, we heard a new high school was being built right down the street for us, which was exciting because it was three traffic lights away. We were not zoned for the school at that time. <clears throat> Our daughter, when she went to school, evaluated Prince William County Schools programs, not the school. She is now attending the University of Mannheim graduate with honors under the Cambridge program, I'm very proud to say. My point in this is Prince William offers a lot of choices for everyone. No one is excluded from opportunity. This is quite simply about change, geographic space, and the number of students in an area. Change is constant, and here even more so. There's only mo so much space over time we have seen empty spaces fill up and every bit of available space will be used either residentially or commercially, lest the county makes it a park or some other protected area. The expansion of residential space means that continued changes in school zone boundaries are inevitable. So what makes sense then? We say plan school zones to their closest communities, reducing traffic and congestion. The two plans that the county has outlined incorporating the 13th high school does that with even more factors considered, and the Planning Commission task is dauntless, and I thank them for that. 
Nobody is being excluded in these plans. Populations in affected areas will continue to grow and boundaries will have to be drawn again in the future. Thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. Any roots? Good evening, and thank you for the opportunity to address you tonight. My name is Edie Rutz, and I live in Planning Zone 40 off Groveton Road. My address is on file. My, our current high school boundary is Battlefield. I read an article after the last community meeting in which Mr. Trenum was quoted as saying, I think it's pretty important that every community or group that is being considered for change has an opportunity to see at least one plan that reflects their desires. I am here because my small community has not seen such a plan. In both of the proposed plans, PZ40 will move from Battlefield to Stonewall. The planning factors from School Board Policy 264-2 do not support this reassignment. For context, in our tiny neighborhood, there are five kids total, and our SY2324 population planning number is one. That one student will not affect the balanced enrollment or demographic balance planning factors. The only factors that impact our small neighborhood are transportation efficiency, which favors the 13th high school, and improving geographic progression of communities from elementary to middle to high school, which is the whole reason that I am here tonight. This is where the current proposals fail us. When we purchased our home in 2009, our school assignments were Tyler Elementary, Bull Run Middle, and Battlefield High School. According to your geographic assignment, we oriented our lives and then our children's lives in the direction of Gainesville and Haymarket with a pivot towards Bristow when we were reassigned to Chris Young Elementary. Our kids go to elementary school in Bristow and will go to middle school in Gainesville. The 13th high school is exactly between these schools. We'll bring together our Chris Young and Bull Run communities and is an ideal improvement in our geographic progression. Conversely, Stonewall is 180 degrees in the opposite direction in a new and different town. This area is too large and too busy for us to build and maintain lives in three different towns in three different directions. You are required to consider improving our geographic progression, which would place us in the 13th high school, and there are no planning factors that counter that placement. A reassignment to Stonewall is a direct contradiction of that planning factor while providing no advantage. Yesterday, I learned that county development planning documents had very reasonably caused our reassignment to Stonewall. However, while not replaced, those documents had not been updated to reflect the current proposal of Gainesville Crossing, also located in PZ40. The developer's lawyer submitted a statement this morning stating that the revised rezoning application removes all requests for residential units in Gainesville Crossing. Therefore, I am requesting with this new information that drastically changes the long-term population of PZ40 that our tiny neighborhood be reconsidered according to Regulation 264-2 planning factors and appropriately placed in the 13th High School. Thank you, Edie. I'm going to call up the next 10 speakers. Mark Yackel, Lori Stern, Maureen Romano, Kate Olson Flynn, Richard Jesse, Lumna Azmi, Tom Darrow, Aurora Hurtado, Riley O'Casey, Julie Couch. And our first speaker of the second group, Mark Yackel. Um, good evening, my name is Mark Yackel. I'm a resident of Victory Lakes Community and uh, I believe my address is on file. First of all, I wanna thank the uh, planning committee and the school board for continuing to allow us to present our opinions and continuing to care, uh, look at all the different factors to make the best decision for the community and our students at large. We know that this is a challenging decision, one that's not gonna make everybody happy, but we know that um, the work that you're doing will inevitably create the best plan. And so thank you for that. Um, I would say that I'm in um, favor of, of all the plans that move uh, Victory Lakes into the into Patriot High School. Specifically, I think the new plans that the board presented um, most recently, um, and I think they support the criteria that have been laid out of what they want to accomplish. And so I'm going to just run through those criteria very briefly. 
the first criteria is probably the most important, and that's the projected enrollment in school and um, school capacities. Obviously, we're not even having this conversation if if the if the uh, if the current schools weren't way over capacity. Um, I believe that uh, that most of the the plans bring down this, especially bringing in those two new schools, OP and Brentsville, bringing down the capacity, allowing um, the reduction of or elimination of the trailers, and really putting a the transfer rates in probably better uh, alignment so that we also give our students the opportunity to go to some of the fantastic programs that we have that have been currently eliminated. Um, the second is transportation efficiency. And, and I know that, again, especially in Plan 1A, that reduced our, our driving by about 10%, about 500 hours that our current students are on the bus, which I know we can think of much better things that they could be doing with their time than spending 500 hours on a bus. It also drastically reduces the hours that are under, um, that our, our school bus drivers, that frankly, we don't have enough of um, also. So I think there's a real benefit to that. Um, Third is the demographic issue, and I will say, again, this is probably the most contentious and most challenging in there, and I think that demographics does play a role in our a child's ability to get a great education. I will say, though, that Victory Elementary is 54% minority, so that actually gives um, the new school, the Patriots uh, High School, as it's zoned currently, um, that, that much better of an opportunity to increase that demographics in that school. Um, fourth is, is the residential neighborhoods together in geographic progressions. We know this is a challenging piece and really one that can't be fully acknowledged. However, I will say that Marstella currently has two thirds of the students going to Patriot High School and one third going to a different high school. And that just makes a, a, that adaption into high school that much more challenging for some of the students where they're taken away from some of their friends. We know that they can get, make new friends and we can do that. But why put that burden on them if we can, if we can help avoid that? So in, in, in conclusion, I just want to thank everybody for their hard work. Um, but we believe that uh, Plan 1A, especially including the ones that are just presented by the board, are the best adoption for that. So thank you very much. Appreciate thank it. Thank you, Mr. Yackel. Lori Stern. Hi, I'm Lori Stern. I am a teacher at Stonewall Jackson High School, and my address is on file. Regarding the boundary proposals before us, I understand demographics are difficult to balance because of the communities different schools serve. However, is it not a reasonable expectation that the district seeks to not exacerbate this issue? Here's the issue. Specialty programs in the transfer process must be revised and more carefully monitored, and this would help balance demographic concerns that have been raised there's a way to begin to address them first. The planning committee should come up with a new plan and begin with the number of students residing in a zoned area. There should be no guessing about where they may transfer to. It has been argued we can't move a neighborhood into an overcrowded school, but for example, OP is only overcrowded because of transfers. Not including transfers, it's at 60% capacity. Stonewall loses over 500 students to transfers. Second, the current regulation states that if a student withdraws or is dismissed from a specialty program, he or she may be returned to the assigned base school. The wording must be changed from may to shall be returned. If a freshman changes her mind about being, say, an AP scholar, the freshman should be at her base school and there needs to be district oversight to see this happens. There is currently little to no monitoring of this. It is a principal's job to serve the best interests of his or her school, but it's the district's job to serve the best interests of all the schools. Third, the county must cap the number of transfer transfers a school can accept. How is a school like Stonewall with two specialty programs able to compete with the rest of the schools on the western side who have more specialty programs? As it now stands, the county is providing more dollars to schools they've chosen to give more specialty programs to. The specialty school program has become less of a way for students to further explore their interests than it is a way for parents to get their children out of the school. Decades ago, Dr. Kelly's vision was that specialty programs would be placed in schools where it would combat white flight. I would argue specialty programs have, in actuality, given white flight its wings. Thank you. Ms. Romano. 
Good evening. Um, my name is Maureen Romano. My address is on file. Um, I'm a Victory Lakes resident. I've lived there for over 15 years. I sat there at the last meeting, and the only argument I heard repeatedly for Victory Lakes to be moved to Patriot was that people wanted their kids to remain with their friends. Not one time did I hear anyone acknowledge the fact that Victory Lake residents can go with their friends from kindergarten through 12th grade. They choose not to. They can go from Victory to Marsteller and then back to Stonewall. I, I completely understand when they're at Marsteller, they meet kids that go to Patriot and Brentsville. However, it is not the school's responsibility to make sure they're with every single friend. They have the opportunity to go with their neighbors and it is a choice people are making. And my concern is that this choice is, of being with friends is taking priority over uh, making sure that other kids have an equitable education. The kids at Stonewall. I am concerned that if, if any of these plans, one, 1A, one two, gets passed, that these kids at Stonewall will not have a voice. And these are the kids we need to look at. I get, I, you know, and to be honest with you, I'm actually a social worker at one of the high schools. And so I'm coming here, and, and, and you know, partly it's coming as a parent. I have two Stonewall kids. I'm a Victory Lakes resident, and I'm a school social worker. And I get concerned when I hear kids do not have a voice. And these kids at Stonewall, we know they do not have a voice. Their parents are at work, they don't speak English, and everyone else comes to the meetings who, who can come to the meetings and have a voice. And my concern is that is taking priority. The friendship is taking priority over these children. And to piggyback on the transfers, I totally agree. This is part of the problem. And I know for a fact that a lot of these kids aren't transferring for the academics. They're transferring to be with their friends or they want to be on a specific sports team. That is not... That is not equitable education for anyone. I've been at many events lately at Stonewall, and I see all these events going on, and I look at the number of kids that are at, involved in the activities, and they're from all the neighbors, neighborhoods that will now be wiped out of Stonewall. These, I know education's academics, but it's also about community, and those will all be gone. I've also noticed at Stonewall, what happens is a lot of the kids in those neighborhoods pull the disadvantaged kids to join the activities. That would also be gone. Like I said, I'm a social worker at a high school, and I, when I'm in a meeting, I, I think of two things the entire time. I focus on this is someone's child I'm talking about, and after the meeting's over, I ask, if this was my child, would I be satisfied? And I challenge you all to do the same. Remember, these are children. They're not numbers, and these are children who do not have a voice. Secondly, I ask you, if when, whatever plan gets decided, if it was your child, would you send your child to Stonewall with these numbers? Because if you cannot say yes, I would send my child to Stonewall with these numbers, then I think we need another plan. Thank you. Thank you. Kate Olson Flynn. Good evening, board. Uh, Dr. Waltz, you have my address on file by now. Uh, my name is Dr. Kate Olson Flynn. And I'm here tonight to express my gratitude for your work this year on the board. Parents Who Care and I thank you for the time you took to listen to us, to hear our concerns about our school and its inadequacies, and to work together to make the facilities better. With your care, time, and budget, our school will be better able to help serve the kids and families in our community. We saw how hard you worked this past year with a new chairman, how you overcame your differences to ensure that Prince William County Schools has a brighter future with higher paid teachers and more counselors, and while I may come before you and pose hard questions and share important issues and observations of inequity that are evident in our county, I want you to know that I realize how each of you is here on the board to make our school system better. You are here because you care. It's not for the money. <laughs> and for all of this, I thank you. And I want to recognize Dr. Waltz for his unfathomable support of the students in this county. Your presence at school activities, performances, and events throughout this spring has elevated the morale of the entire Prince William community. By driving and showing up all over the county, sometimes dressed as mascots, answering tweets, taking time to take pictures with students and post them for all to see online, you have demonstrated your adaptability at social media, how much you care about the students and their schools, and you are everywhere. Thank you for endlessly supporting the kids and for uplifting the spirit of Prince William County Schools this year. And lastly, I can't be here without challenging you all on the board, because that's what I do. Prince William County Schools recently posted the Schools of Excellence from the state. And what a fabulous, fabulous achievement for each of those schools, and I congratulate them for their success. 
What didn't surprise me in seeing who received this honor is that there wasn't one Title I school on this list. None of the schools recognized are ones that serve large numbers of ELLs and disadvantaged students. That fact alone is not unique to this county as the problem of segregation and achievement in Title I schools is nationwide. Therefore, my challenge to you is this, to think about. How will you ensure that in disadvantaged students in the poor communities have the same learning opportunities, the same quality teachers who stay in the profession, the same quality of facilities, the same rigorous curriculum and programs that allow them to problem solve and think critically, not just test prep for the SOL? All these factors contribute to student achievement, well-being, and success, and these factors are not the same in all of our schools. These are issues that, if resolved, will bring academic achievement and opportunities for excellence in all our schools, but particularly in the schools and communities that need it the most. Please consider them when thinking about boundaries, curricular and specialty programs, leadership and instruction, because these students are the ones who need you to step up the most. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Olson Flynn. Richard Jesse. Good evening, my name is Richard Jesse, my address is on file. Well, if we're here again talking about boundaries and so forth, uh, it's, it's an issue. You know, one of the things I, I want to say is that uh, what we are dealing with, and we're talking about the six factors, there's one factor that is required by law, and that's racial balance. And that's a factor that this county, this school board, and this district has to make sure that they are following or they're going to get sued. And they're going to, you know, you might win, you might not. But that's the one factor. Transportation, economics, all these are not factors that are required by a federal law that you have to comply with. Now, the school system it appears to me, came out with a justification why the racial balance is fine in this situation. Ronald Reagan had a saying, trust but verify. I'm not a lawyer, but I do know lawyers. And the legal opinion that the school system put out seems, first of all, to be justification why we can do what you're going to do. The legal opinion, after talking to some lawyers, and why do I talk to some lawyer? Trust to verify. When you look at the, the situation, the cases that you put out and the reasons, it seems to be flawed. And I'm not sure that you can legally defend even the things that you're saying that you're able to defend. And we have talked to some lawyers about that. And I think the board needs to relook at their legal opinions. The other thing I would say is that if there is a major change to a plan next week or at the next meeting, there should not be a vote on that plan because there is no citizen input. And to do so is a disservice to the thing. When you, you bring out another plan, even if you have to come back during the summer for a special meeting, I think you need to do so. Because if you introduce a new plan and the citizens have not had time to, to deal with it and talk about it, that's a disservice to the community. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jesse. I think recent high school graduate, Lubna Asmi. Good evening, oh, sorry. Good evening, Vice Chairman Wilkes, members of the school board, Dr. Waltz, and hello again. My name is Lubna Azmi, and I'm the former 2019 senior class president of Stonewall Jackson High School. My information is on file with the clerk. 
I'm here to represent my entire community, those who were able to attend tonight and those who unfortunately could not be here. And previously before I was able to get up here, there were many students and parents that had to leave because they have commitments um, later on tonight or tomorrow. And many of the kids here tonight, which are like me, graduated just two days ago, but are still here for our community because we understand how much it has impacted us. And quickly, I'd like to ask everyone here for Stonewall to please stand up. Thank you. I think that we have spoken. We've poured out about our, un how unjust the current plans on the table are. We've brought you into the hearts and minds of the members of our community and their experiences because of Stonewall and because of the emphasis of diversity. We've showed you how important that aspect is time and time again, and I'm here to say it again. We can find compromise with all the communities that have expressed themselves. We can find a balance, especially with the direct input from many of our parents, teachers, and students. We must all stand here together as not only members of our individual communities, but members of Prince William County, asking for a just plan that benefits everyone in a fair way, not just to make people happy, but to create something that is right. Thank you. Thank you, Limna. Mr. Darrow. Uh, hello, my name is Tom Darrow. I I'm a Stonewall teacher, and my address is on file. I don't have a speech. I, there, there's just a, a few points that I would like the <clears throat> school board and other uh, important parties to, to take into consideration. Um, a couple of people have mentioned the six important factors. And from where I'm sitting, it seems like every factor is being addressed, except for demographics. Uh, you know, transportation, distance, you know, kids with their friends and all that. Um, but when you see uh, <clears throat> the statistics for all of those categories go up for only one school and down for all the others, and that one school happens to be the oldest school on this end of the county, then you know, that's, that's clearly not addressing the demographic issue. Um, I'm concerned about the potential lawsuits that could come out from this, Department of Justice investigations. Uh, the county just went through a whole, you know, DOJ thing a few years ago, and as a teacher, I really don't want to have to go through all that training again. Um, <clears throat> there is also a concern from many members of the Stonewall community that uh, not enough is being done to reach out to the parents and the families of the at-risk students. Uh, a lot of the information that's being posted online is only being posted in English. Uh, the whole 13 high school portal as far as I can tell, is only in English. Uh, a lot of, there's a lot of reliance on you know, Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and all this, and you know, many of those families don't have internet access, they can't attend meetings because they have you know, different work hours. <clears throat> um, another unrelated thing is uh, a lot of people have been pointing to the website Great Schools uh, for the statistics, and the information on there is severely flawed. Um, because it does not take IB scores into consideration for college readiness. Um, so as a result of this, Stonewall has like a one out of 10 in that category, and that brings down all of our, our other stats. So you know, that's a little <clears throat> um, bit of an issue. Um, transfer issues also need to be addressed to try to balance out the schools more evenly um, so that you don't have one school getting all these transfers and other ones, other schools being gutted. And the last thing, this is just kind of a, a personal pet peeve. Um, when I'm hearing some people from school districts that are currently zoned for Stonewall and they're being put into a different school district in one of these other plans and they're saying, or, or they're, they're, being, they're, they're remaining with Stonewall in the current plan and they're saying, oh, my kids are being forced to go to Stonewall. Well, that area is already currently districted for Stonewall. So if anything, you're staying with Stonewall. And uh, you know, from what the kids and so forth have shown, uh, being at Stonewall is definitely not a bad thing. So thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Aurora Hurtado. Good evening, Dr. Waltz, members of the board. Um, Aurora Hurtado, my address is on file with the clerk. And 
I am probably one of the newest members of Parents Who Care. Thank you for the shout out, Ms. Jesse. Um, and I got involved with Parents Who Care after the boundary process for the Eastern Elementary Schools left me pretty much traumatized. <laughs> um, but I have seen and I have been inspired by the change that we can impact by advocating for our schools. So to the parents that are here, I want, you, I want to invite you to reach out to us and to join us so we can can advocate for equality in our schools. And um, after looking at the plans for the 13th high school, I'm concerned about the inequality that's being perpetuated by these boundaries. I do not envy the position that you are in. Uh, I'm sure you weighted these decisions and you're weighting them carefully. And personally, I don't know if there is any plan that would ag address the inequality and segregation that these boundaries um, have exacerbated. But please, let this be a lesson. Please capture the concern and frustration that our community is feeling now, so you can consider a better approach before building another $150 million school. Um, I'm not assuming that there is an easy or a cheap way to bring equality and equity to our schools but I am confident in your ability to find a way. Please level the playing field for our older high schools before dragging our community to another divisive boundary rezoning process. If I have seen something, uh, observed something on this process, is that Stonewall Jackson is a great community. Don't they deserve a great building as well? <laughs> what <laughs> Woodbridge is a great community. Our students also deserve top-notch facilities. So let's consider that and let's improve what we have before we continue building inequality and division in our community. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you, Ms. Hurtado. Riley O'Casey. Good evening, Vice Chair Wilkes. Board members, Dr. Waltz, my name is Riley O'Casey. My address is on file. It is Wednesday. Thank you, Mrs. Jesse, for wearing red. We wear red for Ed on Wednesdays. June 19th, I'm expecting every board member, Dr. Waltz, to be wearing red. Thank you. I come to you this evening as the president of the Prince William Education Association, the union that advocates on behalf of the students and employees of Prince William County Schools. Boundary changes have, in the past, been seen as a contentious ordeal that pits neighbor against neighbor and school against school. At the end of the day, however, the goal should be what's best for our students. The vision of the Prince William Education Association is a great public education for every student in Prince William County. All students deserve nothing less. Speaking on behalf of the PWEA Board of Directors, I urge the school division to continue developing a boundary plan that will be what's best for our students. Follow that regulation that, was, that you put in place I think everybody's quoted from it, uh, Regulation 2642, consider the demographic balance. Board members, I urge you to not vote on a boundary plan that does not follow this regulation. Please continue to reach out to the citizens of Prince William County, County especially the students. Their exceptional behavior is something we can all learn from. The National Education Association, the Virginia Education Association, and the Prince William Education Association believe with every fiber of our being that regardless of zip code, every student should have the same resources, support, and opportunity to exceed. Thank you, and I'll see you on June 19th wearing red. Thank you, Riley. Julie Couch. Good evening. My name is Julie Couch and my address is on file. I'm here tonight to request that Osborne Park High School not be included and kept out of the 13th high school boundary fight. Last minute switches without full detail. Don't give anyone a chance to respond. We've been through this before at OP recently. 
and it especially coming after graduation is really difficult. The 13th high school was increased by 500 seats at the final school plan vote to ensure an excess capacity on that side of town that would allow for future growth. It did its job. There is now an excess of capacity on the west with the opening of the school. The rest of the county is waiting on the next high school for relief of overcrowding. There is no reason then to send students out of this region with SX excess seats to school that is overcrowded. OP is stabilizing after a very dramatic boundary change at the opening of the 12th high school. It will endure another major boundary battle with the opening of the 14th. While suffering a dramatic loss of students at the opening of Colgan, OP has stabilized and is back to being over capacity. OP, a well-worn school about the same age and the exact same plan as Stonewall, with a capacity of 2,430 students. And I've seen one estimate on one of your plans that takes it as high as 3,063 students will be overcrowded at 130% capacity the next three to four years, or longer if the 14th is delayed, as most schools are. Therefore, it makes no sense to move students from an area with empty seats to school that is over capacity. An OP needs to not experience any more of an enrollment roller coaster than it's already on. The only reason to move students out of a region with empty seats to a region that needs to build seats is to somewhat better balance the demographics of Stonewall Jackson as compared to the 13th and its surrounding newer and well-advantaged schools. OP is a majority minority school. It does not lack diversity. The group of students that I saw on the what if plan that is considered to be moved to OP are from a densely populated area, very near SG, Stonewall Jackson, that has significant number of ED and LEP students. Moving these students to double and triple their current distance from an older school that has lacked investment to another older school that has lacked investment seems to be an all too easy short term and short sighted approach to easing a tough boundary battle. This is unacceptable and better demographic diversity needs to be worked out among the schools that the 13th was built to relieve. It's become a pattern Thank to you, take Ms. highly Couch. successful schools. Sorry. Time is up. Thank you. Thank you. Our final nine speakers tonight, Suzette McCarthy, Jill Kloss, Cozy Bailey, Carolyn McNeil, Sonia Dorland, Margaret Gauter, sorry, this is handwriting now, Jennifer Smith, Leslie Montiel, Ravinda Parasyan, I apologize, Parasyan. I happen to know Suzette McCarthy is not here this evening. Thank you. Um, so, Jill? I'm Jill. Okay, Jill. Thank you, Jill. <laughs> Dr. Waltz, school or everybody, my name is Jill Claus. My address is on file. I live in the Occoquan District, but my children's schools are in the Coles District. I have a recent graduate and a rising sophomore. Any changes made by boundaries will not impact my students, as she will be a sued senior by the time high school 13 is open. I shared my concerns with Mr. Deutsch, but felt the entire board could benefit from the observations of a parent without a dog in this fight. Osborne Park High School took a huge hit when Colgan opened. Numbers for economically disadvantaged ESL and minority students increased, and since changes were made at the last minute, minutes before the vote, citizens were not aware nor able to comment on any impacts. I am uncomfortable pulling OP into the boundary discussions for the 13th high school at this time. There has to be a better way to balance your diversity on the West End. I have consolidated all versions of data I could find into one spreadsheet. I have copies if you would like them. And I believe that there has to be a better way to balance numbers for Battlefield, Patriot, Stonewall, and, and High School 13, but it will be a painful process especially for neighborhoods who do not value diversity. There is no reason for Stonewall Jackson High School to have such drastic increases in diversity while numbers for every other school impacted 
is decreased. If OP and Brentsville have to be pulled in now, I request you pull Colgan in as well and fix some of the mess that was created during that entire boundary process. We will never fix the issues of, bal of balancing population and demographics if we continue to only listen to the neighborhoods with the loudest voices. At the Colgary boundary, Colgan Boundary School Board meeting, River Falls was removed from OP's boundary at the last minute without even considering the numbers. OP will take another heavy hit when the 14th high school opens. These issues were discussed at our most recent PAC meeting and no one there was in support of adjusting the boundaries now since a huge investment is just around the corner. OP is projected to be over capacity next year. It was century located when it was built, but has the boundary it does because Manassas and Manassas Park pulled out. It has no choice but to get transfers. My children have never had a bus ride less than one hour. We are down a very dangerous path where old schools are increasingly becoming more diverse and economically disadvantaged while new schools are not. I am quite thankful my youngest will be a senior when the next boundary change happens because OP will be stripped of its most active parents. I actually asked at the PAC meeting who would still be in the room if that happened and we all raised our hands. If the school board is not willing to diversify the West End is relying on a small shift of 25, 250 students from Stonewall Jackson into OP, which is already quite diverse now, I would like to make signs for both schools that say, abandon all hope, ye who enter here, because neither school will have a voice left. I hope the work that we started as part of the infrastructure task force will help fund much needed budget and improvements of the older schools. And I would like to see a fair and balanced boundary approach so the older schools are not the only ones increasing diversity. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Claus. <laughs> Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Oh, oh it's, <laughs> it's. Sorry. Good evening. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wilk, Dr. Waltz, rest of the school board members. Um, my name is Cozy Bailey. I live in the Potomac Magisterial District, which is ably represented on this august body by Mr. Justin Wilt. My address is on file. I uh, speak to you this evening as the uh, president of the Prince William NAACP. One thing before I go into some of my prepared remarks is that I appreciate the sentiment of many of the citizens who come up here and talked about what increased diversity means, but I must ensure that everyone recognizes that just because you increase the number of minorities at a school doesn't mean you're increasing diversity. In the case of Stonewall Jackson specifically, you're decreasing diversity. Now, as I got into this program, people began to call me and I understood what was going on. I decided to educate myself by going to the meeting at, on the 16th of May at Patriot High School. I must say that what I found there was a travesty. It was a study in official misrepresentation and obfuscation with more than just a little bit of dishonesty. What I found was that instead of pursuing a course of action that takes advantage of the diversity in this greater Prince William community, the committee has endeavored to, to bring back segregation. It is almost like modern massive resistance. You see, in, in this year, when the arrival of the first enslaved Africans landed on the shores of what became the Commonwealth of Virginia, it is, it is, it is, this, this action serves to eradicate whatever progress has been made in those ensuing 400 years. But what is particularly an affront to all citizens of our great community is the quoting of judicial actions that truly have no direct bearing on what we have to do here. And it's not lost on me, and it's not lost on others in this community that this is an intentional attempt to justify an immoral plan. This school board was elected to further the quality of education to all of our students. And in doing that job, interaction with your constituents is an absolute must. But when members meet not to inform and to learn, but to coach speakers to speak at forums like this on what to say and how to present their case, as Mr. Trenum and Mr. Deutsch have done, you've crossed the line. You crossed that bright line of what is ethical and what is not. As I have spoken with the variety of students, parents, and others in the community, I have been confronted with two untruths. One I spoke about, about the misunderstanding of what is diversity. And the other one is that black students need to go to school with whites in order to achieve. Untrue. I asked 
that you reject both plans, all three plans, that you, that, and that you commission to create a new plan that addresses the equities of all students and thereby enhance the pursuit of the title world-class education. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. <laughs> Carolyn McNeil. Sonia Dorland. Okay. Glad you could join us, Dr. Latif. Good to see you. Well, so on that point, can you hold the timer? Uh, my apologies. I was coming from Battlefield's um, commencement, and then my son had a, uh, my daughter had an award ceremony at Benton Middle School, and he is our eighth grader, and he's finishing up. So my deepest apologies, and um, I will watch the video. <laughs> May continue. Um, thank you. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of things going on here tonight, and some seats are warm tonight. Um, I'm Sonia, I'm from Occoquan District. You have my address on file. But I'm here to really just say um, a few thank yous. Um, not really to burn any seats tonight. Um, I was, I've had an emotional week. I had a Friday where I had a son graduate from Woodbridge Senior High School. And I wanted to thank some of the nice uh, board members and Dr. Waltz that attended. Um, Ms. Satter White, I saw you there, thank you. And one of the things that I've been asking for is a lot of you to come out and, and come to different community events. Um, so Ms. Satterwhite, I thank you for that. I know that Ms. Jessie always comes um, to her district's events and Dr. Latif was there. And um, also Mrs. Williams, which we were knew she would be there because she is, Woodbridge was her school. <laughs> and then Dr. Uh, Walsh also, we found, and I found this to be heart touching when um, all of our students just, I mean, they just stood up and applauded you and I can tell how much they love you. And um, I thank you because I'm always about what goes and, and I appreciate you being a part of our school and we're seeing you a lot more and it means a lot and it doesn't go unnoticed. And then also, I want to say, we had our Old Bridge Elementary Boys Running Club. We went to participate at one of our other districts um, running 5K and we saw Mr. Wilk and he was so welcoming and he thanked us so much for coming and we took about 35, 40 families. And that's another thing, we just support other schools and I think if every district were to do that and then be loving and kind to the other districts and we wouldn't be having so many difficulties here and then keeping the diversity you know, in check and then just loving each other and not having such big problems. That's all I have to say, but thank you all for everything you do, and I appreciate you. Thanks. Margaret Gautier. Gautier, yes, thank you. Um, I'm here to complain, unfortunately, and I appreciate you guys sharing your stories. Um, thank you for the, S the SCAC, I'm sorry, I've never heard of it, really. Um, um, presentation that was really nice, very hopeful. It's really good progress. It's a great start, um, you know. But if you guys want to have the parents' involvement, parents need to know about it because when I asked parents in different districts, you know, have you guys heard about it? They said no. I know this is rel relatively new, um, and it's still you know developing. But you know, that's just a little a little pointer there. Something that I really wanted to bring up was um, the. The topic of appropriate use of power. Um, today I had an IEP meeting and um, I sent an email to uh, several members of the, the entire team on the IEP meeting, including Mr. Bigsby, Mr. Mulgrew, um, Dr. Roper, um, and I did not get a response from them, but when I was in my IEP meeting today, um, Ms. Ms. Um, Jessica Traw took it upon herself to be a decision maker without the team. And that's not something that I appreciate. Um, you know, when you are in the school system, you are expecting your child to receive a certain quality of education, especially if they've been transferred twice within three years. Um, and with that, 
I would hope that given the case, my particular case and other cases that parents may have experienced, that if they have experienced educational negligence and regression in their child due to the incompetence of teachers, poorly managed schools, and poorly, mainly, the site-based thing, that is inefficient because the principals don't always know what they're doing. They're not required to have specialized training so that our kids have a quality curriculum that is executed at their schools. And so when you have people like myself that have been so frustrated over the last three years, this is my third year in a row coming to you about the same issue, and you have someone like Ms. Tra coming in dictating what she thinks is best for my child, that's crossing a line. Um, when me as a parent, when I know what's best for my child and where my child should be placed, I kind of expect for that to happen, especially with the history um, that my son has faced in Prince William County Schools. Now, the fact of the matter is that I have watched teachers take the downfall for mistrial. They have been written up. They have been succumbed to a lot of things because of a lot of mismanagement that has happened on her part. And to be frank, I'm calling for her resignation because I don't think that she's fit for her role or for her position, and I think that she is imbalanced. Um, to be able to make decisions without a team is not how you show leadership. You're supposed to be able to talk to a team, not dictate what you think is best without the team, the team who's been managing a child the entire school year. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Jennifer Smith. Hi, my name is Jennifer Smith. Uh, I, my, I believe my address is on file. Uh, earlier tonight, you heard from Ms. Edie Rutz. Uh, she gave a compelling, uh, I think, description of some of the factors that we reviewed uh, in looking at, at uh, the boundary uh, for, PZ, for PZ40. Um, when she said we are in a very small community, uh, with her and I, you actually have the entirety of the affected households represented. Uh, we live in a, an area that is comprised almost entirely of historic battlefield and uh, industrial lots. Um, and so we have been studying this uh, from afar. I want to first of all also thank you for keeping that portal up to date. Uh, I've relied on it heavily uh, in order to understand the factors, to understand the process. Um, and I think Ms. Rutz did an excellent job this evening of ac accurately describing the factors, how they apply for our current circumstance. And really, um, with that, we respectfully request that we amend, uh, that the board uh, amends the plans uh, to really look at PZ40 more closely uh, and have a fair and accurate uh, representation of those factors um, and specifically look toward uh, zoning us for the 13th district. Um, when I say we've been watching this closely, my husband and I, in addition to looking at the slide presentations, um, are physically uh, watching the uh, area that will be under construction. In fact, on the PowerPoint presentations that are out there, you can sometimes even see our <laughs> lot. Um, so when we say proximity is a factor, we're less than two miles from the projected uh, location. We drive by it when we drive to our uh, elementary school now. So for us, it was quite surprising that there was any result other than that that was being presented. We do understand that there was some flawed information that was perhaps relied upon, and that is why we're respectfully requesting to relook specifically at PZ40. Thank you for your time. Leslie Montiel. This is really terrifying, but hi, my name is Leslie Montiel. My information is with the clerk, I believe, and I want to thank every single one of you for taking your time and listening to my voice. And I'm now a alumni of Stonewall Jackson High. I'm very proud to say that as a student. And uh, my community is Independence, in which, unlike Victory, we're not as close. I wish we can do that, but we have been rezoned multiple times. I have gone to Westgate, Ellis, Piney Branch, Gainesville, and Stonewall. And I know a big point is friendship, in which I personally believe that our adults should not be present in that, because if my parents were present with some of the friendships that I had, I would not be in a good spot. <laughs> but uh, I believe that you should listen to the kids, not the adults that oppose us. 
and Stonewall is still my home even after I just graduated. Um, not really emotional about that because I will come back for band. <laughs> I could spend a good 17 hours at Stonewall with school, march band, and winter guard. So I'm very proud to say that our music, pro our music, pardon me, <laughs> our music program has boosted very much for these last four years as we are Blue Ribbon winners and one of the only schools in Virginia, one out of four, to receive the National Association of Music Merits four times in a row since 2015. The only school in Pennsylvania County to receive this award, which I'm very proud to say that as an alumni. And only 98 schools in this nation receive this award. So I'm very proud to say that. Band is also a family here. Thank you. <laughs> band is also a family in which when we meet up with other bands, especially at a competition or at a game, I've never seen so many kids bond together even though we live so far apart. So I believe that our communities as well as band should just m muse together. And I'm very proud to say that this community of Stonewall I've never felt so a part of, and I believe that our voice should be heard. And I'm just rambling because I'm nervous. <laughs> um, but please take your time to listen to the kids, not really the adults, as we are the ones that go through the experience, not the adults. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and I hope to say that independence to be zoned for Stonewall, as we are such a beautiful community, and I want to thank every single one of you to make that community such as it is, and I believe at Stonewall. I'm thankful for the position that I had as drum major for 2017 and 18, and I thank every single one of you for taking your time every day to listen to my voice, so thank you. Um, I'm gonna have trouble with the last name, um, the, the handwriting, Ra Ravinda, Parisian? Did I say that right? Parisian? Runa, is there anybody here is the last one who signed up? Okay. Um, school board's going to take a 10 minute break. Um, and then we'll start up in, in 10 minutes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. We are going to move to 1801. Um, student housing, high school attendance area recommendations, 2021-22, 13th high school, Mr. Mulgrew. Good evening, Chairman Latif, school board members, and Dr. Waltz. Tonight I'm speaking with you about the proposed boundaries for the 13th high school developed by the planning department in conjunction with input from community members. Here to present on the proposed boundaries is Dr. Matthew Cartledge, the Supervisor of Planning. Mr. Cartledge. Mr. C uh, yeah, um, so b before Mr. Cartledge comes up, I mentioned to the staff that I was gonna just have a couple comments. Um, and I know there's a lot of interest in this. I, I want the entire community to understand that Doing these boundaries, uh, whether it was for the Occoquan Elementary Schools earlier in the year and doing these high school boundaries and next year middle school boundaries are extremely challenging. They, um, and, and we recognize that. I want everyone out there who's come to speak and who sent emails, that we read the emails, we put them, we collect them, we document them, we listen to the citizen comments. Um, it doesn't mean we're gonna do what you know, each person asks, but we are careful in our deliberation and we, we are committed to making sure we can do the right thing. The second thing I want the public to understand about this entire board, and I, and I do believe I can speak on, on their behalf, and I don't think they'll correct me on this, is that each member here believes very strongly that we need to invest heavily in all of our schools. We need to dedicate or rededicate our efforts to make sure all of our high schools, all of our elementary schools, and all of our middle schools have what they need to succeed. And that might mean some schools need more. And so as we look at next year's budget, one of the priorities uh, of, of mine and, and, and I think of the school board is making sure we address issues of equity, issues of infrastructure, issues of specialty programs, we are extremely committed to that. I can tell you that over the course of this year, working with Superintendent Waltz and his staff, 
Mr. Wallingford, we put together a budget that addressed many of the critical needs and needs that that um, many of you see out there as issues that need to have been addressed and should have been addressed years ago. And, and, and part of that is due to financial constraints. And so as we look at next year's budget, we are gonna dedicate ourselves to prioritizing the things that def we need desperately in this county. And so regardless of how this shakes out, and, and it is extremely challenging, and our next couple meetings are gonna be um, challenging, um, I want all of you to know that every single board member up here cares deeply about all of the community, regardless of what you may have heard or what you see or what others say about us, um, in closed session and in open session and in public session and on phone calls and emails with each of these board members, I can tell you they care deeply. And so I, I, I hope I can convey that message to you as clearly as possible, and, and we are going to work very hard on the behalf of the entire county. Thank you. Mr. Cartledge. Thank you. Good evening, Chairman Latif, members of the school board, and Dr. Waltz. I'm Dr. Cartledge. I'm the supervisor of planning in the Office of Facilities Services. I'm here this evening with you to share with you two recommended boundary plans that have come as a product of the public impro input process that began in mid-April. The presentation that I'm giving to you tonight is about the fourth time that I've been talking to many of these parts, and unfortunately, it's not like cheese. It has not gotten better with age. So we will try to move through it as quickly as possible while still being very thorough. In essence, we're here this evening to answer some questions. Why are we here? It's quite simple. We have overcrowding at the high school level in western Prince William County. What's our solution? It's the 13th high school. This board voted on a larger prototype just a couple of years ago to address the overcrowding that was already present, as well as the growth that we were projecting. Within this context of how do we best utilize this new space, we'll speak briefly to the legal framework that speaks to pupil assignments or school redistricting as we have found ourselves here this evening. We'll talk briefly about the process that has been carried out since April, and then we'll briefly discuss the boundary plans. So to quickly speak to why are we here, among these three high schools, Stonewall Jackson, Battlefield, and Patriot, there are 45 portable classrooms that are currently being used for instructional purposes. If we look at the capacity utilizations of not only these schools, but also Brentsville and Osborne Park, the red line represents capacity, 100% capacity. All of these schools, with the exception of Brentsville, in the 2021 and 2023 school years are exceeding their capacity. So the solution to our overcrowding is the 13th high school. As I mentioned, we're going to be building the price model. Unlike the previous prototypes that have about 2,053 seats, this one is going to have 2,557. It is going to have a specialty program for global citizenship. Mr. Mulgrew has spoken about this particular new specialty program at the community meetings. As we move on, there will be a pedestrian trail that will connect Gainesville Middle because of the close proximity of these two. Uh, early in the process, there was some discussion about progress court, the extension, concerns about parking, and the maintenance of that. We have been working uh, very diligently to look at that issue. And as we move forward, we recognize that the school division is going to be maintaining progress court and this extension to Western Bus and the 13th High School. And we've already purchased some additional no parking signs that will be erected along the street and the uh, concerns about parking will be addressed in due time. This photo was taken about a month ago. You can see Jiffy Lube Live right in the center of the photo. The clearing is where the 13th High School is going to be constructed, and the sports fields in the foreground are at Gainesville Middle. Uh, two takeaways to uh, take from this particular slide, talking about future capital improvements. The first one is that there are no plans in the next 10 years to construct additional seats at the high school level in western Prince William County. 
The second takeaway is the additions at the middle school level of Bull Run, Gainesville, and Marsteller, as well as the elementary school being constructed um, along Ashton Avenue area, will give us an opportunity after the boundaries are set for the high schools in two weeks to then kind of retroactively look at the elementary and the middle school boundaries in this area to try to make them coincident with each other. This, the net effect of that would be enhancing the progression from elementary to middle to high school. The next portion of our presentation is to look at the legal framework for pupil assignments and school redistricting. It is the Code of Virginia that gives the school board, not the planning staff, not any of the other administrators, the ability to assign students to a particular school. This is exercised in Prince William County, and these laws shape the school board policy, which has been mentioned several times this evening, policy 264, as well as the regulation 264-2 that serves as the guiding doctrine for how boundaries are established in PWCS. From a legal perspective, we understand that there are two laws that are most relevant to pupil assignments. The first one is the Equal Educational Opportunity Act. This was from 1974. There are two takeaways from this particular uh, legal action. All children enrolled in schools will be looked, up, looked at in groups, not at an individual level. The other is that the neighborhood is the most appropriate level for school assignments. This is what is practiced in Prince William. We reassign what we call planning zones. These are essentially the jigsaw puzzle pieces that we move from school to school. The collection of the jigsaw puzzle pieces or planning zones create the attendance area for a school. The second most relevant law to pupil assignments is the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. In essence, pupil reassignments are not to be motivated solely by race or ethnic group. This is not to say that legally speaking, the school division cannot be mindful of what the demographic composition might be resulting from boundary adjustments. What it's saying is that the sole purpose for reassigning a neighborhood cannot be race or ethnic origin. Moving on, the Equal Protection Clause goes on to say that it tries to help shine some guidance on how school divisions deal with the residential development patterns that occur in your area. And it says that the school officials are not expected to correct segregative conditions resulting from factors beyond their control. So based on where people choose to live, it is not the school division's responsibility to try to correct that in terms of what is the composition of the resulting schools in the area. With these laws being fully explored, we can conclude that the following is a prescription for complying with the law when performing school redistricting. We've identified these four, bull full, four bulleted points we're going to consider only the factors that have historically been considered in PWCS. We're going to give each of the factors consideration. We're going to focus on geographical areas or neighborhoods rather than on individual students. And we're going to have a process that incorporates the public from the very beginning. As I mentioned earlier, the Code of Virginia is what gives the school board that authority to do pupil assignments. We incorporate this code into our school board policy 264 and regulation 264-2. We provide in the first bullet of point that the Equal Protections Clause is there and it's very evident. We are providing boundaries that provide for the instructional effectiveness and the health, safety, and general welfare of all students. We've also listed the factors that have historically been considered when we are redistricting. Clearly, we try to balance the enrollment so that we don't overburden one school while underutilize another. 
We consider the demographic composition, minimize the times that a particular neighborhood has been reassigned at that same level. We also look at the transport of our students and try to do that in an efficient manner. We avoid splitting small neighborhoods and then strive to improve the progression from elementary to middle to high school. This slide essentially outlines the process that has been carried out. We began with the scoping meeting at high school boundary. Planning is a little bit different than elementary or middle school planning. There is not a committee formed. In lieu of a committee, we have a scoping meeting before the very first boundary plan is crafted. The intent of that scoping meeting is to gain input, identify preferences, concerns, and learn about the local geography from those who call that area home. We held our scoping meeting on April 11th at Battlefield High School. After that meeting, we crafted plan one. We posted it online. It was available one week prior to the first community meeting. This was held on April 30th at Stonewall Jackson High School. After that meeting, we crafted Plan 1A. One week elapsed, and then we had our second community meeting at Patriot High School on May 16th. At this time, we'll move into the discussion of the two proposed boundary plans that the administration is recommending to the school board. The first one is called Plan 1A. Provided to you is a map of the boundaries. Perhaps the best way to explore this is on the 13th High School Boundary Portal. It's interactive. If you go to tab five, you can type in your address and it will tell you your school assignments based on all the proposed plans. In the final report that is on board docs and is provided to you all this evening, page six of that report outlines the specific communities that are proposed for reassignment. Again, the best way for the individuals at home to check how this might affect you is to go to tab five on the 13th high school boundary portal. Uh, just to quickly walk through the area, so we're looking at a map. The blue lines are the current high school boundaries. The shading represent the proposed attendance areas for these schools. The 13th high school is located right here. And I can get, if you can give me a head nod, I can walk through the communities or for the sake of time, we can move on to what the enrollment numbers look like. Move on, thank you. Mr. Trenum, thank you. All right, so we have the differences here from the current boundaries listed at the top. That's if no boundary changes took place, the middle, portion of the table is what the enrollment figures are and the demographic composition based on plan 1A. Just for clarification, the demographics are not projected numbers. Those are the resulting percentages if the boundaries in plan 1A had been in effect back on September 30th of this school year. The very bottom of this slide shows you the differences between the current boundaries and plan 1A. For example, we are projecting that Battlefield would have 3,059 students in 2021. If you look at Plan 1A in 2021, Battlefield is at 2,279. If you go down to the bottom where the differences are, you can see that there is a negative 780. That's interpreted to mean that 780 projected students are proposed to be removed from Battlefield to reduce the overcrowding. As part of the implementation of high school boundaries, seniors are not reassigned. The 13th high school, just like Colgan and Patriot, were opened without a senior class. The numbers in 2021 reflect not reassigning the senior students. Therefore, you'll see that the true overcrowding relief that the new school offers, that's really not manifested until 2022. Might be a little bit simpler to look at this graphically. So based on plan 1A, this shows the first year the school is opened, that's with the seniors not being reassigned, and then the third year that the school has been opened. In plan 1A, the 13th high school, Battlefield, Patriot, and Stonewall are all brought beneath their capacities. Moving on, plan two was crafted later in the process. The key differences from plan 1A to 2 
is that Barrett's Crossing and Linear Farms are assigned to the 13th High School rather than to Patriot High School. Sheffield Manor and Independence remain at Stonewall Jackson High School rather than being reassigned to Patriot High School and the 13th High School respectively. Lastly, Patriot High School's attendance area extends along 234 to Sudley Manor Drive. Again, we have the similar table, same layout. These figures and demographics represent the configuration present in Plan 2. The key distinction uh, from a balancing of enrollment perspective is that Plan 2 does not bring all schools under 100% capacity for the first three years that the boundaries are in effect. You can see at the end that Stonewall Jackson is marginally above its capacity. In an effort to try to compare these plans uh, from a quantitative or a numerical fashion, these next slides are provided for your consideration. As we look through the factors in our regulation that we have considered historically, we look at the efficient transportation. The top left corner of this slide shows what the sum of distance traveled from each of the planning zones would be based on the current boundaries as opposed to Plan 1A we see that there's about a 58 mile reduction from the current boundaries to plan 1A. This equates to about a 7% decrease in travel distances based on reconfiguring where school, uh, excuse me, to where neighborhoods are assigned, trying to bring more students assigned to their closest school. Uh, we look at the geographic progressions from elementary to middle to high, there's actually the same number of unique progressions. They might be different progressions, but overall we still have 37. The bottom one is the balancing of enrollment. We can see that based on the current boundaries, we have overcrowding, and then the orange bars show that we have all of the schools underneath their capacities. Slide 32 shows the demographic composition in a comparative way from the current boundaries all represented by blue bars and the orange bars are representing Plan 1A's configuration. You can explore this at your leisure. We've produced a similar grouping of slides for Plan 2. You can see that the travel reduction is quite similar. It's about a 7.5% reduction. There are three fewer geographic progressions in Plan 2 and then the bottom shows the enrollment balancing. Oh, excuse me. Again, we have shown the demographic composition, same format. The last comparison is to compare plans 1A with 2. And these slides show the projections for the year that they're opened and then the three year, the third subsequent year after the boundaries would go in effect. Again, the key distinction that in plan two, Stonewall is the only school that is slightly over capacity. Slide 36 shows the comparative demographics between plan 1A and plan two. At this time, the planning staff would like to recommend that the board receive this information and consider adopting either Plan 1A or Plan 2, that you permit that rising 12th graders are able to remain at their currently assigned school, and that you permit rising 11th graders to make a one-time decision to either stay at their currently assigned school or to attend the newly assigned school. Uh, on behalf of the planning staff, we want to thank all of those who have been active in the boundary planning process. We think that these plans are better because of the public involvement, and that concludes our presentation. Thank you very much for your time. Um, discussion. Mr. Trenum. Sure. Or questions. Um, 
don't think questions so much, just some observations and some comments. Um, the uh, first off, um, I want to thank I want to thank uh, Mr. Cartledge, Mr. Beavers, and the the entire planning staff for all the work that they put in, into this. It does take a ton of work, um, and high school boundaries are never fun. Um, but uh, I'm going to go into a little bit of history and also uh, some concerns. And I'm going to say some things that some people aren't going to be happy about. That's fine. Um, uh, first thing, back in 2014, I had a meeting with one of our associate superintendents. And at the time, I said, when we do the 12th high school, which was Colgan, we should probably rebalance the entire eastern side of the, uh, uh, side of the county. And then when we do the 13th, we should rebalance the entire western side of the county. The, uh, the schools were opening fairly close, and it would be an opportunity to, to kind of balance things um, and maybe buy us some time on the 14th and give us some flexibility. We chose not to do that as a board. That's fine. So when I mentioned it to one of our associate superintendents, a different one, this last fall, the response I got with that was, well, we're going to do that with the uh, 13th and the 14th. Okay, fine. But when we go into these plans, we're not doing that. And specifically, and that's where the impact of not including Brentsville, not including Osborne Park, limits us. And I think that affects the, uh, the, the projections and the numbers. Um, I'm also concerned about the, the methodology that, that we use in that. Our, uh, our projections are our projections are based, based on the state of affairs as they currently are. And what does that include? That includes where, where students live. It also includes transfer rates. It also includes policy and operational decisions we've made. Specifically, transfers have been closed off uh, at Patriot for a number of years. They're opened up just a little bit now. And we closed them at Battlefield as well. So that all affects the projections. Whenever we Whatever boundaries we, uh, we approve, um, those, those, will, those uh, con constraints uh, will, will go away as far as the policy constraints. And also the transfer rates will change. We know they'll change. We don't know exactly how they're going to change, but we do know that they're going to change. And in a lot of cases, we can make some educated guesses. So from my concern, I'll be honest, I can't support either of these plans because I don't have confidence in, in the projections. And it's nothing personal against our staff. They do a great job and they work hard, but those are some significant factors. And I'll go back to, like I said, go back to some history. When we, in 2009, we did the Patriot Boundaries. Um, and uh, we had to come back in 2000, and actually, So in 2009, uh, we did the, the Patriot Boundaries, and we were expecting the enrollment to, to top out about, actually about 2,300 students uh, last year. But in the planning time, we, it was only supposed to be, get like 2,100, and 2,143 was actually our, our plan for five years out. Uh, we had to go back in and redo those boundaries and pull out a, a Pretty, pretty large community because we were we had overshot so far that it was causing problems. Um, Brentsville High School at the time we, we were we were planning on it to be around 1,100 students, 1,100 plus, which is a good number for that student for that school. Um, we we it came in at under it dropped down to like 69 percent capacity, like in the eight low 800s or even possibly under it. So um, that was hard on that school. We we. Damn near broke it. I mean, we had to go in and provide a lot of help. The principal had to go in and teach sections of a math class in order to help make things work. So we got through it, but um, but we we need to learn from that. When we did the Colgan when we did the Colgan boundaries, we went back and. Um, once once again. I don't, I think this, these are the constraints, but once again, uh, our, our projections for Osborne Park were way off. Now, 
we did some things to kind of mitigate that, put in some more programs. I think we got kind of lucky and that the, we were way off, but we were way off in a way that helped us out. Um, our Colgan numbers are a couple hundred students, about 150 to 175 right now, a couple hundred students over our projections. As a board, I think we've made a mistake and put too many students into, uh, to begin with, but even then our projections are a couple hundred off. And Brentsville, once again, Brentsville, uh, we, uh, our projections were for it to be around 1,100 students or what have you throughout, um, it's dropping below 1,000 is expected for next year. And my take on looking at all these proposals is if we don't do anything different, we're going to be about 100 or 150 students uh, less than that in Brentsville. Uh, again, which is once again going to put the, uh, a lot of stress on that school. So that's why, from my perspective, I wanted to look at the entire western, western portion of the county. And we need to take those uh, things into, into account. So assuming that we're not going to change those, then we, we well, knowing that, knowing that the transfer rates change and knowing that we, make, that we change operational and policy decisions on the way we operate the schools, that gives us two options. We can either we can either do the boundaries based on where we expect kids to live only and assume transfers just are, are on top of that, or we can try and anticipate what we think those transfer rates are and kind of mitigate that. So that's, that's my real concern with, that's my primary concern with both of the plans that we've got before us. I, I think we're, my fear is that if we, if we, if we approve either one of these, then we're gonna, we're gonna see change that we're gonna have to come back and fix again later. Um, and waiting until the, waiting until we, making these, waiting until we see how all the, all the transfers settle out by that time, uh, you've, you've put schools through a, a lot of additional stress. Uh, and the other things, I, I think if we just look at them, um, for instance, in our, in our projections, we show uh, Battlefield going down to uh, 1,800 and some odd students. Um, like I said, with the, with, uh, that's what transfers essentially close. As soon as you open up transfers, nobody in the nobody realistically expects Battlefield to drop below 2,000 students. Um, once you once you open back up transfers, you're going to get kids transfer in. Um, so I, I have some real real concerns and real issues with the plans be, because of that. I think we need to take those uh, into account. I do think we need to do some policy things. I think some, some people had some some good points. I think we need to. We look some of the some of the policies and the way we manage uh, our transfers and our and our and our transfer uh, uh, policies. Um, yes, we've got 500 about 550 uh, students that transfer out of the Stonewall Jackson uh, boundaries, but that's not the only school that experiences that. And there are several that have have much higher that have significantly higher transfer rates out than that. So that's a countywide issue that that if we're going to address, we need to address it countywide. So. Um, that's my, that's my comments and the observations on the, on the plans as put forth. Uh, the, there is another, uh, there is another uh, plan out there that uh, came out of conversations that, that um, uh, I had with our planning staff. Once again, I appreciate the time. You all did a great job. You all did a great job on that. I do appreciate that. Um, but when I look at that plan, I look at it trying to take some of those factors into account. It's like, okay, where do I think things are going to be different from what that is, and is, are, is that acceptable? To me, that's just one plan. It's a, it's also another point of discussion. Um, so, uh, but I, I do think it's important that we we have uh, some other some other things to discuss and uh, things to look at. Um, I'll just give my general philosophy uh, out regarding boundaries. Is I do, I do believe just because it always comes up. I do believe, I believe every every parent should have an opportunity to want what they think is the best for their child, what school they think is best for their uh, child to attend without being accused of having some malicious intent. Um, I, 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 I believe every, every individual should have the opportunity for, of, what, of whatever their preference is, they should have the opportunity to make their best case. Um, but I also tell people that Nobody is entitled to a particular outcome that you want. And oh, by the way, any outcome that is going to happen has to be an outcome that at least five board members will agree to. 
So the board provides an overall check and guidance on that. So those are part of the things that, uh, that come into these discussions. So that's my, that's my initial set of comments on this. Uh, Dr. Waltz. Um, let me just say for the time being, I'll keep about 90% of my uh, thoughts to myself, but I would at least like to ask Mr. Mulgrew to comment on the Colgan uh, statement, please. Good afternoon. Good evening. I'm sorry. Uh, the Colgan situation, when we're talking about the Colgan being overcrowded, it was the original intent of the Planning Commission. I think they did an outstanding job with the numbers that we had. But when the decision was handed, the board decided to increase the, uh, the enrollment at Colgan, which meant that we now had to put transfers in. I was directed by the board chair to put transfers in or develop a program for OP. And some of the students that ended up going to OP to fix the problem of OP's under rim came from Stonewall when we put the pre-gov in. So um, I agree that that was, but the original part of the, of the board prop, the, the planning commission, the one that I, when I worked on that one, our numbers and our recommendation did not have Colgan overcrowded. It was when it came to the school board, the school board decided at that point, which is their prerogative, which is your prerogative, to increase the student enrollment. Um, I think Ms. Jesse was next and then Ms. Williams. Uh, <clears throat> uh, could I see slides 14 and 15? Could you put the 14 up You're for missing. me? <laughs> You're much better. <clears throat> the equal protection. Okay. Um, I want to ask some loyally questions, Ms. McGowan. So um, I'm going to make a preface statement that says the following. I'm not a lawyer, and I don't play one on TV. So <laughs> please be kind to me. When, but there, there are people have come to me about this um, equal protection clause that we have. First of all, I'm concerned since I've been here with the boundaries, and, and I know Mr. Trenum has been here longer, that we've never had to put uh, that we're doing this because it's the legal thing to do. Uh, I am concerned that by our boundary plan, we moved Stonewall from 80% minority to 89% that we are ourselves creating a segregated situation. And you know, most of you know that I grew up in a segregated school and I've dealt with this situation in some workshops and things that I've done. And it's very challenging. And I'm concerned that the lower income kids move from 50 to 60%. Uh, I've worked in those types of schools uh, all of my life, really. And it is challenging work. Uh, so, they, the questions that I have uh, about this, and I, I sat with some people and they tried to school me on this, that when they were saying these, the, the law that we're using, there are questions about it, um, and they used the term that the, the, the parents involved in community schools is, is not from is from a concurrent opinion versus a majority opinion. Uh, and if you could help me with that, and if it is, does that law actually protect us if it's not from a majority opinion? And I'm told that um, Justice Robert made the uh, majority opinion and that the citation, the, what we have, what we've presented as a board is what Mr. Kennedy, Justice Kennedy, made as a concurrence. This is Jesse. I'm not going to give legal advice to the board in open session. Okay, thank you. Okay, I'll, what I, what, could you get back with me on it? Okay. So um, the other question is this whole idea of uh, the 
when you mirror, when you look at it, the Seattle case, balancing diversity from, could you check and see if in fact in that Seattle case, they were balancing diversity, but there was not a difference in the academic benefits. In other words, uh, we don't want to talk about it, but the fact is that parents do look at student performance, and they want their kids to go to the school that they consider higher performing, whether we want to talk about it or not. And I don't think parents need to apologize for that. In fact, as a former Title I school, I know that at one point, and I don't know if it's true now, if the school was not performing at a certain level, parents had the right to move their children to a higher performing school. So I think that these parents are uh, concerned. And when we look at the difference between Patriot and Stonewall, and I, I know, Dr. Latif, you've talked about this, and that we need to make sure all these schools have got the necessary resources to be competitive because there is a difference in the ranking, there's a difference in the on-time graduation at those schools, and we need to do something to, uh, we need to really look at that. Uh, the other thing that um, is the fact that at Stonewall now, 250 students from Stonewall are transfers to Osmond Park. And so the Osmond Park, I have to, you know, the, you, Mr. Mr. Trenum, Mr. Doach, you're not gonna like what I have to say about this. I know that I brought a plan in, and w when we were looking at our, at our plan, it involved um, Diane's district. I'm sorry, I shouldn't call you by first name, but we're friends and I do that. But the first thing I did when I decided I was, it involved her is that we brought her in. And we said, look, this is what we're doing and it's gonna affect your district. How, what do you think about it? And we talked to her. I, all of a sudden I see Osborne Park and I am the attending board member and I've had no input into it. I didn't know you were, that you were doing it. And so parents are calling me from Osborne Park and yesterday, I didn't know, even know that this was on, on the agenda. The other item on the transfers, I was checking, and I need, this, these are some questions that I have. I'm having problems with my thumb here. Got a little thumb problem. Okay. My question is this. When we bring in Osborne Park, and the people at Osborne Park are saying, please stop. They were affected by what happened with Kogan. They lost half of their staff, they lost their kids, and they've had to build up their staff again. Why are we now being required to be a part of a plan where we're now going to go through the same thing? They're, they're projected, from what I understand, to be overcrowded, and how do we deal with the overcrowding? On transfers, transfers at the high school level are really different in a sense than when I was principal at the elementary level. But I always had to give priority to my base kids. So if you ask for a transfer and I was, I was at capacity, I could say I'm gonna reject you. So if we go with this Osborne Park thing, we have 250 because they had to build up their school because we took away their base kids and put them into Kogan, right? So they have 254 kids from, uh, from Stonewall, 90 kids from Garfield, 77 kids from Woodbridge, 39 kids from um, Battlefield. They have Kogan, they have 123 kids from Kogan. Uh, they have kids from um, Forest Park, I think it's about 34 kids. And they're, there's it basically, they have over a thousand transfer. So all these people from all these schools on the east and on the west, are we gonna tell them that they need to move out of, of uh, Kogan? I mean, they need to move out of the Osborne Park because if he ends up with more kids and he's over capacity, 
somebody has to go. I'm not talking about the transfer that happened with the football situation. I've heard about, but these people have transferred to Osborne Park because of the specialty programs that they have. So the impact of this at the last minute is a problem. And I was, first of all, to Mr. Carthage and your staff, bless you, but because all of us are calling you. And when I talked to them today, they were saying that um, they're willing to work with us, but they, they project that Osmond Park is going to be overcrowded. And so then Osmond Park is going to go through another plan. It's, it's, they're on a roller coaster. And so I, when I talked to them today, they said, well, we haven't gotten a lot of complaints from Osmond Park. I got a complaint last night that was so loud that my husband said, you need to hang up on this lady because they are, they're not, there are only a few, a few of them right now, but they are, I'm telling you, they are irate because they said that they met with Mr. Dalt and he asked them, would you like to be a part of this and as a parent advisory council? And they said, absolutely not. And yet they are part of it and they're also upset that this is happening at the last minute that we're doing this on the last day of school when people are leaving and many people have already left and that we're trying to pull the wool over their eyes by waiting until the last minute. So those are the items of concern that I have. Um, I just have a couple of questions and I don't need them answered this evening by any means. Um, well, first, <laughs> Yes, you did. It's okay. It's all okay. It's okay. It's late. Um, one, um, I'm familiar with the area, but I don't drive around quite as often as I used to, mostly because I had a senior this year and I was pretty landlocked in where I was going with him. Um, but uh, from the looks of these um, bar graphs, it seems to me that the neighborhoods surrounding Stonewall Jackson just naturally have a higher rate of economically disadvantaged um, LEP and minority students than any other geographic area around any other high school by looking at the bar graphs. So that's why I said you don't have to answer me tonight because I'm, I'm sure you may have memorized it, but that's okay. I can, I'd like to just that, that read that. That could be a layup question. Um, yeah, and then... I know, it's okay, it's okay. I, I'm personally, I can't believe you still have hair. Um, and I also wanted to know, um, what would this look like without transfers? I mean, transfers are supposed to be designed to bring equity to, for all of our students so that kids can go to a specialty program that they're interested in, not for other reasons which we, um, let's just skip that. Let's just say, what, what does it look like our student-based population? Is, is there truly a way to build a base school that is majority populated by our neighborhood with an allowance for a certain number of transfer students for the high schools involved in the boundary equitably and fairly across the board? I don't know the answer to that because I think it really depends on how many people live where. Um, so that's why I said you don't have to answer that right now. Those are my two asks. And then, um, y you know, Ms. Jesse brings up a good point uh, that I didn't think of until just now. It is the end of the school year and people are going to get really hot that we're having this discussion and they're off thinking about vacations and other years. Um, my ask to this board is if we are going to be serious about this and we were very serious about moving a lot of students around, why not have a work session and actually in this time around take further comments from other people um, instead of having a work session where people just came and watched us talk about boundaries. Um, since we're all about giving people a voice, and I would definitely like to hear more from the students. Um, as someone who um, I'm sure Mr. Turner Ms. and Ms. Satterwhite can identify with this, you've had seniors already come through the system. One of the things that I learned um, having a student matriculate through the system is when you're a parent of an elementary schooler or of a middle schooler, it is very scary to think about sending your high schooler off to high school with kids they don't know. And that's because of our own personal experiences, all we have to pull from. What I have learned is, um, as my son has the students who are closest to him, except for one, all go to different county high schools. 
Um, and that started in middle school. And as a parent, I was terrified. I was like, oh my goodness, I'm going to send you to school and you're not going to know anyone. And he was really short, sorry, Lee. He was so tiny. And I was like, oh my God, they're going to like put him in a locker somewhere and we're never going to find him. Um, they all graduated within the past couple of days. I got one graduating tomorrow. They are just as close, if not closer now than they were going into this process. Nothing to do with where they go to school everything to do with technology. These kids don't even drive, so it's not like they're facilitating their own friendships because of their geographic nature, because they're driving. It has everything to do with technology. It has everything to do with these kids are different than we are, and they live differently than we do. And I think that the Stonewall student who came here and spoke before us made a very valid point. The students are living in a different time and a different existence than we as parents can even imagine or identify with when it comes to maintaining friendships, being able to talk, being able to learn from each other. And I think it would do us justice as a board if we took the opportunity to see it from their perspective as well as their parents' perspective and making these boundary decisions not just on this high school but in every other school coming up because it is very different and that's a very big deal. And it's something, if you have a parent of a young child, you have no idea about until you're actually there. Um, and, and that's all I have, and I, and I really hope as a board we consider those things. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Jesse, or Ms. Williams. Um, okay, um, Ms. Satterwhite. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. There is so much to address. Um, I want to thank you for those opening comments because I had written some things down related to that too. Um, I want to thank everybody for their emails. There are so many that it is just absolutely not possible to respond to them all, but we are reading each one and we definitely are taking note of what people in the community say. Um, social media and email have talked about, um, I haven't heard from this person. We are just coming off of, as of tomorrow night, the end of graduation season, and we still have another week of end of the school year activities. Actually, is it a week or just next week? I'm losing track. Um, I'm day to day right now. All of us have had very busy schedules, in addition to several of our members do work full time. So we ask for your patience with that. As we're doing all of these things, we're checking emails between events, late at night or early in the morning, we're looking at whatever the latest is in the portal. If we haven't responded or commented on a particular aspect of the plan or comments we've heard from the public, it's not because we don't care or we're ignoring any communities, it's because simply we are doing our jobs and we have a tremendous workload right now. So this whole process, as was pointed out earlier tonight by Mr. Ronco, it's not meant to pit neighbors or communities against each other. Um, the focus is this is about opening a new high school so that all of our students have a chance to learn in an environment that is not overcrowded. We got into a situation in Prince William County Schools that because of all of the building that's happened, we can't reduce class sizes anymore at this point. But with what we have planned over the next several years, what we're working on with the Board of Supervisors to continue to reduce the number of trailers in the county, we're working on creating that space. That's why we have this 13th high school with the price model that's larger. We're working on creating that space so we can reduce class sizes. And so, as Ms. Williams pointed out, so we can also allow students to transfer again. And in order to have that kind of space in a school, we really ideally, in my opinion, we need to have the schools below 100% capacity um, once we get to year three to year five, because otherwise we can't reduce class sizes and we can't have more space for transfers. And those transfers do allow all of our students an opportunity to try out and do different things um, according to what their interests are. I'm looking to see where I am in my notes since I've kind of kept going. Um, the concerns about Stonewall Jackson High School that have been expressed by teachers and students we have heard you loud and clear, and even before this process began, there are those of us who have started having conversations or continued conversations. I do want to point out that the Infrastructure Task Force was first proposed by Mr. Trenum to address our older schools, such as Brentsville District um, High School, Stonewall Jackson High School, Garfield, Woodbridge, and I know I'm forgetting something. OP, thank you. And so that's how we started it. Money that we just allocated in this past budget is not just going to turf fields and not just going to gems, but the first floor at Osborne Park High School and at Stonewall Jackson High School will be renovated. It won't happen this summer because we have to put the bids out. The money's just gotten approved starting July 1st. But next summer, you're gonna see a lot of work being done at both of those schools. 
So we are taking note of it. I've, I myself have had conversations with Dr. Waltz, Mr. Mulgrew, who's Associate Superintendent of High Schools, and I also had a very long and very good conversation with Dr. Nichols when I was at Stonewall for the Origin Project. And I've spoken to teachers at Stonewall Jackson High School, and there are a lot of specific needs. We're listening, we're talking about these things. Those are things that can't necessarily be addressed with the boundary process, but those conversations will continue even after we pass a boundary of some type on June 19th, assuming we pass a boundary on June 19th. Um, but thank you to all of you who have brought these concerns to our attention on top of the things that we were already working on. Like I tell my constituents, I don't necessarily know there's a problem unless you bring it to me. So when it comes to um, Gainesville District, most I mean, Gainesville District includes students who are currently zoned for um, schools in, let's see, I'm looking at our current boundaries. Gainesville District students attend Battlefield and they also attend Stone, Stonewall Jackson High School. When it concerns Battlefield, we're currently flirting with 3,000 students. We have to move a minimum of 1,000 students out of Battlefield High School. And the question is, where do we do it? And it's, I've heard from so many people, but we've always been in battlefield. Well, we've all always been in battlefield because that was until before, and that was um, once the school was built. And originally, all of Gainesville District was at Stonewall Jackson High School. Battlefield opened in 2004. It happened to be the year that I moved to, into the area. So it's very hard. Change is tough. There was a comment made about um, that Ms. Williams made that, that touched something off for me about um, students starting at a school where they don't know anybody. I was just at a breakfast yesterday at Mountain View Elementary School where we were celebrating our military heroes, our students whose families are active duty. And we have a large number of those in Prince William County. Those students come into the division and they don't know anybody and they're starting in a new school. So I just want to highlight and give a special shout out to our military kids who do that every single duty station. And they are so incredibly resilient. So I want to thank the people who've spoken tonight, the people who've spoken to each of the, uh, each of the community meetings, the scoping meeting. I've been at each one. I have massive notes on all of those, and we are listening. But it comes down to we're trying to make space for all of our students. We're working very hard. I have had a focus for years of reducing class sizes so that each of our students get more attention from their teachers and can work and can, we can see the result academically. And this is not about pitting neighbor against neighbor. This is about giving all of our students opportunities. And that's what I am very focused on. Um, I, don't, I don't think we're there with Plan 1A and Plan 2. Um, I think those are great beginnings because they've come from input from our public. Um, Mr. Trenum has brought some things forward that I definitely think we need to consider. Um, and then talking about OP and, um, and Brentsville, those are not my districts, but I was surprised at the very beginning we weren't including OP and Brentsville District High School in this plan because I consider them Western schools. And I thought, too, we were balancing out Western with this boundary. So that was a question I had at the very beginning also. Um, and I'm not the only one who expressed that. So bringing them in last minute, it's not really bringing them in last minute because this is something that's been discussed since before the scoping meeting. And it's been a concern. We've been talking about the transfers and the numbers. And um, there's been talk with school board members tonight. Ms. Williams said, what would this look like if we had the numbers without the transfers? Ms. Williams, we have asked for that. And we would like that too. And that's, that's where the, um, there's a new map that I saw was posted. Thank you, planning office. Um, the residing students flow map. Thank you for that. Um, I spent some time looking at that today. And I'll be spending more time looking at that because it shows us where students are going from each school when you use the um, tools in the map. And to our planning staff, I know this is a tremendous job for you because you're getting even more emails than each individual school board member. And you're trying to answer them to the best of your ability too. And you're working with everybody in Western Prince William. And you're working with school board members now that you've presented this to us. And you've had individuals in the community come to see you. There was one person who spoke tonight and I suggested that he set up a meeting with you because I thought it would be very helpful for him to spend that time looking at those maps with you. Um, Ms. Williams, you brought up some great, great questions. Yes, and comments. Transfers do bring equity to all students. That's why we've got to get these capacities at the schools down enough that there are room for transfers. And points were made tonight by the public. Um, I believe Mr. Trenum said something about it too. Um, we, 
I think policy-wise, we need to adjust the transfers so that we don't allow transfers to overcrowd a school, and that we keep the base, you know, we keep a certain number that, if transfers are overcrowding the school, nobody's benefiting correctly. And let's see, Ms. Williams also mentioned, you know, there's gotta be a way to build a base school with room for the students to transfer. I agree. You also referenced possibility of a uh, work session. I'm the one who suggested it in the elementary process last time. I am definitely open to that. Um, I mentioned that early on in the process too, that I wouldn't be surprised if we needed to do that. I'm open to it. If that's the will of the board, I, I don't think it's a bad idea for us to get together. Um, I wanna thank again everybody who has sat through the hours of time at, at the scoping meeting and at each of the two community meetings because, and then tonight also, here it is after 11 o'clock, thank you for taking the time to speak up and be involved in your community. And I hope that when we finish this process that we remember we need to work together as a community. I was talking with one parent tonight. Um, the student leadership councils and all of our high schools have started working together across county on projects. Yes, they're rivals on the sports field, and they might be rivals academically, but it, when, when it comes to community, our kids are leading the way in projects that are helping people in our community. From Stonewall Jackson's Leadership Council with the collection from the entire community of, I forget what number, I want to say it was a thousand stuffed animals to the hospital. Um, Woodbridge High School, Battlefield High School working together to raise funds for hurricane relief in Puerto Rico. Patriot High School, Battlefield High School raising thousands, tens of thousands of dollars for childhood cancer research. Our students are doing great things together and I hope that when this is done, the day after we have our vote, I hope everybody else works to make our community, continue to make our community the amazing place it is that we all chose to live in. Thank you. Mr. Chenum. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I do want to address a, a, a couple things uh, and some comments. Um, first off, Ms. Jesse, uh, like you pointed out, OP right now has a, a thousand transfer students coming into it. About 250 of those come from the Stonewall Jackson uh, boundary area. M my, my take on this is if, if we were to approve either of these plans is a lot of those, they would lose a lot of those transfer students. So the, part of the idea of moving students into it is to uh, replace some of those students that would be lost. Um, so the other thing is, like, talk, like we've already mentioned, um, a, allowing, having a, a, a school that's severely overcrowded because of transfers is an operational decision that we need to make. OP has been closed to transfers in the past. It's lotteried them uh, in the past when, when, they, when they were over full. So that's been done before. But right now the way it's done is kind of on, a, on an ad hoc basis whenever be, between the principal and the Return to the principal and the administration and the school board representative that says, you know what, this is this is enough. We need to we need to call a timeout and and slow things down. Um, that's the way it seems to work out, as opposed to a, a set policy that the school board says, you know what, we think at, at, at you know once a school gets to a certain amount, a certain percentage, maybe we need to look at uh, lottering. And at another threshold level, maybe we need to, to close them. That said. Um, uh, like Ms. Williams says, we, we, have these trans, we have these specialty programs to be available, and when we close a, a school to, to transfers, we close off the opportunity for those specialty programs to other students around. So when Battlefield is closed, guess what? All the other students in, in that area can't leverage the uh, IT program. Part of this does go to the, uh, uh, part of this discussion does go into include, are there some specialty programs where we need to duplicate or add a third level if it's the IT program or something like that uh, and to give some more opportunities. Um, uh, right now the pre-governor school is at, uh, is at um, OP. That's about 150 to 160 kids. Um, so uh, do we need to expand that out and do some more in the east and the, and the west and, and give some more opportunities for those kids to take those programs closer to where their base school is and help uh, distribute that. I think those were all part of the discussion as well. So, but. Yes, my question is, uh, we, we anticipate something's going to happen with the transfer, we, but we, we have not involved Osmond Park in this conversation. We haven't had a long discussion with them and saying, look, this is what we're going to be doing. And you've got like eight or nine different schools that are sending huge numbers of kids 
these kids are in these programs, and if for some reason they end up not being able to continue to attend, it's going to be a problem. So I, I'm just saying that, that it, and it's last minute. And so uh, I, the people at Osborne Park are asking, those who've called me, is saying, please leave us out of your plans. Give us time to, uh, and waiting until the last week of school to include them in this big shift, we would be for them, is a little bit too much, but we can talk about it later. Okay, Mr. Deutsch and then Dr. Waltz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so let's so let's just paint a picture. Uh, we've got we've got two high schools coming up, uh, the 13th and the 14th high school. Those are the only two high schools on the capital improvement plan that we have over the next 10 years. Uh, largely, we're going to balance out high school enrollment uh, with those. Uh, we should be able to fix most of our overcrowding at the high school level with that, especially if uh, current projections as far as students uh, student growth in the county uh, continues. So those are, those are our opportunities to address high school overcrowding. Um, this is obviously the first of that step. Uh, one, other, one other point of reference. If we're talking about boundaries, then we should be talking about the students that live in those geographic areas. And I think that's where the conversation about transfers comes in, um, and that's where um, having them in the, the data has made this whole conversation very interesting. Um, I know myself, Mr. Trenum, other people have pushed from the very start of this that if we are drawing boundaries for a high school, then the students we're looking at in terms of these boundaries should be who lives in there right now. And, you know, transfers are the icing on the cake. And we should have the capacity of the space for that. And as we build out, we're, we're going to have that, right? Um, but w all of these numbers that we're looking in have assumed transfer rates baked into them. So the numbers we're looking at right now are not just who lives in a planning zone who would be attending a school, but who lives there, who's projected to live there, but then also an assumed transfer rate. And that becomes part of, part of, part of the problem. Uh, when we, and this is something I brought up a number of board meetings ago. Um, this is not a, a new thing that, that we've brought up in the discussion. Um, I think we've been talking to staff about this since probably March. Um, and so this is definitely a, a, a long time concern. When you look purely at the schools, um, how many people attend a school um, that live and are currently zoned there? If we talk about neighborhood community schools, that should be a number that we put a high focus on. Um, Osborne Park is a th about 1,000 students under capacity. Colgan, maybe 700,000, somewhere right in there. Colgan is over capacity based on boundary attendance. Um, and so if we are looking at two high schools for the rest of the county for the foreseeable future, it would have been very reasonable from the start to deal with the Osborne Park under capacity situation and the Colgan over capacity situation and have those two schools um, have the middle of the county be the line for what we're looking at with these two sets of high schools. One of, one of the other things, just in terms of the Osborne Park situation, if we're looking past the 13th and the 14th high school, to assume that we're going to continue to add the additional 700 to 1,000 students that we need from transfers into OP, after we level out student capacity across the county is very hard to do. Um, you're going to have, the, there's a lot of students from the eastern end of the county um, that are transferring to OP. So that requires students to be transferring past Colgan, and if we're looking at the current site that we've talked about publicly uh, for a 14th high school past that site as well to then transfer into OP. The number of students coming in there from the, uh, from the east is going to reduce. We will have reduced overcrowding at Battlefield and Patriot significantly. We'll have one more brand new school in the west. The, the push for students from the western end of the county to come to OP on a transfer basis is going to be reduced. So 
if we don't do anything about OP, possibly in this map and the next, we've got to add between these two maps significant space to OP. If we don't do that, OP is going to be in a lot of trouble. Significant space. I'm confused. They're going there for the program. I, uh, uh, are we, are we having an open conversation right now? Go ahead and finish, Mr. Deutsch. All right. <laughs> We're, if we don't, well, not, okay, sorry, not space to the high school, but space to the attendance area to add more students in. Thank Geographic you. space to the boundaries, that's what we're talking about. Um, no, we don't need to add more space to the school itself. Um, but we need to be able to bring more students in to make sure we have the space filled up when we get there. Um, so I think that is, that's the long-term concern um, between how we do the boundaries and also placement of this uh, 14th high school, but that's another conversation to get to later. Uh, and so that's a 200 student addition, possibly, to, uh, to OP, aligning it with the current feeder patterns of Parkside Middle um, is not an extreme situation. Um, we're adding a very small percentage of what needs to be added to OP in the long term. Um, so that's, we, we should have been starting with that from the start, and so um, that's that's conversation we should have had from the start, and uh, you know, it's, it's, good to, uh, it's good to have that, have that discussion. Um, we are, we are working very hard to listen to everybody. Um, I've had numerous meetings with people um, about um, these boundaries, about these school sites. Um, board members here are willing to meet with anybody who wants to sit down and talk. Uh, and not everybody was going to get what, what people want in the end. Um, not everybody can be made happy in a boundary process. Um, but we will listen to, uh, meet with, talk with everybody uh, who wants to, and uh, if people want to sit down and talk, I'm more than happy to do so. Mr. Uh, Dr. Waltz. Well, just a, a couple of comments. One is, if you go back to the Colgan decision, which was made at the 11th hour, we had meeting after meeting after meeting where OP uh, supporters basically were scared that it was going to destroy the school. And so let's remember, Colgan's only in its third year. So we came to the board, even had the principal come to the board. We said, we have a plan. This plan will work. There was a lot of consternation about whether or not it would work. Well, we had every confidence in the principal and the programs. Mr. Mulgrew worked with that principal. We had just the opposite occur. The school is overcrowded. But let's remember, this is three years. So to come in here at this point and start guessing around what's going to happen to OP and somehow factoring them into this boundary thing after they have beautifully stabilized, I, I will just say that's a concern. The other thing that I would caution you, um, I'm a person who supports choice. So when you start legislating choice, just remember that every decision you make that caps enrollment at a school or caps a program capacity, that always works until one of your constituents or your neighbor's kid or somebody's brother that can't get in the program. I mean, we work those things out pretty well. What I would be more in support of is, hey, the pre-governor school over there has worked, worked like magic. Maybe we need to put that program, replicate that program, into Stonewall. And oh, by the way, I don't want to give a big speech about Stonewall, but, you know, people almost create a perception that Stonewall doesn't have top drawer academics and programs. They just got through winning. They were sixth in the nation in the Sea Perch contest. Those kids were, of all the 100 schools involved in Sea Perch Robotics, the this teams representing this whole region were from Stonewall. Sat there for two and a half hours listening to these authors who wrote the Origins Project. 
getting feedback from an internationally famous author and, and congressman giving feedback as these kids read brilliant work. Uh, when we talk about the graduation rate and some of those things, that school is fully accredited. Not only that, but it's the language. If there is an issue, it's the language. We have some students who come in there in ninth grade and they don't know English. They just moved here. In two years, they have to take the SOLs and they have to pass their finals. Well, I don't know about you, but if somebody, you know, if I moved to Russia and I had to learn Russian in two years to pass high school exit examinations, that's difficult to do. So uh, again, I think these choices are good, but if, if that's really what you want, let us go back to the drawing board and see if maybe there's something else we might want to do um, over there at, at Stonewall. But these, one of these students who talked about the music program, that, that music program, that's just another whole area. But it has had excellence in music for over 20 years. And to, to be a Blue Ribbon school in music, I mean, those are adjudicated by other people outside of the district. So, you know, I just, I just got to give a shout out to Stonewall because I'm very, very aware of the excellent programs that they have over there. But I'm really concerned about pulling in other schools at this point in time because we're going to guess about the, the communities that actually live there and maybe we should, these kids are going to be leaving. Uh, uh, that's a lot of unknowns. Miss Jessie. Uh, Dr. Waltz, thank you, because I was here, I was part of the Kogan, and I was part of the Osborne Park, and I met with those parents, and those parents were very upset, and they were calling me saying, what are we supposed to do? We're not going to, and now they've gotten these programs, and if we start messing with Osborne Park, we're also messing with Garfield, with all, all these other students. What are they going to do? Are, are, am I going to still be in the specialty program? I have parents who drive their kids to Osborne Park, and I know that sometimes, um, Dr. Cartledge, if you could please come to the podium. I know that sometimes, I know he said why. Uh, I'm still here. I know I that leave. sometimes we say we're not comfortable with the numbers. Uh, and, and yeah, the numbers are not always correct. But I asked him, do you project that Osborne Park is going to be over capacity? And he says yes. And I, I, I've been in that office, and they have the expertise in there, and I think they've thought about all these other kinds of things that could happen. So I don't, I think as board members, we can project and say, we, this is what's going to happen, and this, I think these people have a better idea of what's going to happen than we do. I, second guessing and putting the lives of all these other kids and putting Osborne Park through another situation is, and I, some other idea, I thank you for bringing that to the, the attention. But do you, I guess the question from you, from me is, when I talked to you earlier today, because I got all this information today, and uh, do you project that Osborne Park is going to be over capacity? Yes, and I think it's a good time to kind of level set the expectations on student enrollment projections. Like any projection or any forecast, you look at how phenomena have behaved in the past. You make assumptions, you use best practices, and that produces your best estimate for how something is going to behave in the future. Uh, Colgan was the first high school that I worked on. And through that process, through our projections, the ultimate approved boundaries, if my memory serves me correctly, this year it was going to be about 116% of capacity based on the approved boundaries. Uh, several decades ago, a couple decades ago, there was a seminal piece of scholarship produced that was based on a survey of school planners throughout the nation. And school planning is actually a really niche market. There aren't a lot of us. Um, 
fortunately for me, I've got pretty good job security. There aren't many replacements. Why would there be? Uh, yeah. yes. Fair question, fair question. Uh, anyways. It's kids out there, this is not. This is not for you. Not the job for you. No. Through the survey, they asked the school planners, what are reasonable projection accuracies? What's a reasonable margin of error? They said that at the division-wide level, for every year you go into the future, 1% error is reasonable. Five years into the future, at the division-wide, 5% is reasonable. Colgan came in with about 5% at an individual school. The projection methods based on how the history behaved came in reasonably, actually exceedingly accurate. Now, as we're having these discussions, yes, the projections do not reflect these assumptions, these changes in policies. They don't do that. It's not the projections fault. That wasn't reality. We can provide you the numbers of residing students in each school based on a boundary plan configuration. Here's what I caution you about. When you start projecting residing students, our models also incorporate students generated from new developments. So if you're only looking at students who are residing there here and now today, what happens when you assign a planning zone to a school that has a development that becomes approved and starts generating more students. We will gladly work with the board. We will try to provide every bit of data. I think that now we're up to 11 tabs on our 13th high school boundary portal. That's a response to community concern, board concern. It's not that we're unwilling to provide you what you're asking for. It's just not our recommendation based on our subject matter expertise. And yes, OP, to get to your question, I'm sorry, yes, OP is projected to be at 117% of capacity based uh, on the current boundaries. Thank you for putting up with us. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Okay, as I see no more discussion, I'll just weigh in a couple comments. I would like to echo Dr. Waltz's um, statement. You know, I'm new on the board, it's been a year. Um, I would love to have the kinds of programs that are attractive to people that make them want to move at each of our schools. I would love to have the kids in that community stay in that school. Those kinds of things cost money. There's a reason why we have one program at one high school or one at one in the western end and one on the eastern side. So as we look at what we're going to do in the fall and as we look at the budget process, I'd like to remind the public that many of our uh, caps or restrictions on our ability to do more based on financial things. So as, as you look at, you know, sending us emails, consider sending emails to the county, county Board of Supervisors as well to, you know, open up the spigot for us to be able to fund the kinds of programs communities need and want. They are extremely popular. Um, there is a reason why these kids are bouncing around. And I'd love to have those at some of the other schools. I want to make those opportunities more available to our kids. We're going to close this discussion. We will be back here in two weeks um, on this. We're going to move to now um, 20, where are we at here? 1901. Oh, great, 1901. Miss Goss. Can I, can I ask one more set of questions? No. I only went once. No. You can email it. Ms. Goss, revisions to the Code of Behavior. Yes, good evening, Chairman Latif, school board members, and Dr. Waltz. Tonight, two of the dynamic directors from Student Learning and Accountability, Ms. Carolyn Custer, Director of Student Services, and Ms. Dara Duggar, Director for OSMAP, will be presenting the changes in the Code of Behavior for the 2019-20 school year. Overall, the recommended changes are based on Code of Behavior Committee recommendations, changes in VDOE guidance, and newly passed legislation. I hope you will allow me a moment um, to honor Mrs. Custard. She is retiring at the end of June, and this will be her last Code of Behavior presentation. She is leaving 
a led leadership legacy of extraordinary positivity, true caring, and kindness within the Office of Student Services and our entire division. And it has been my honor to serve with her, and I will miss her greatly. Please join me in giving her a round of applause as we welcome both of these ladies to the podium. Good evening, thank you, Mrs. Goss, and to all of you, it has been an honor to serve. Good evening, Chairman at Large, Dr. Latif, members of the school board, and Dr. Waltz. I am excited about the opportunity to present the recommended revisions to the 2018-19 Code of Behavior for your consideration. Presenting with me this evening is Dara Duggar, Director of the Non-Traditional Education Opportunities. Dara and I have worked collaboratively on these revisions. The Code of Behavior Committee is composed of a variety of stakeholders throughout the community. Recommendations were discussed by the Revisions Committee and approved by the Superintendent Staff and Division Council. It is important that re revisions reflect our world-class expectations for a safe and positive learning environment for our staff and for our students. This year's revisions address attendance, excessive absences, and specific language related to immediately reporting incidences of bullying. Students are given ways that bullying can immediately be reported to school staff. Revisions also include procedural changes at the OSMAP office, and these revisions will be explained shortly by Dara. There are also minor revisions in language to ensure clarification for all stakeholders. And these relate to the Office of Student Services. To support attendance and academic success for all learners, schools will convene attendance intervention meetings and develop attendance improvement plans. It is our hope that this will provide additional assistance and support to students and their parents. And additionally, there is specific language to encourage our students and our parents to immediately report incidences of bullying, and this is to ensure that assistance is immediately provided to students and to parents. The complaint of bullying form is provided, and also ways bullying can be reported to school staff to ensure there is no fear of retaliation. Good evening, Chairman at Large, Dr. Latif, members of the school board, and Dr. Waltz. The OSMAP changes to the code of behavior are minor this year. However, OSMAP will undergo a few procedural changes to, due to actions by the Virginia Department of Education and the 2019 General Assembly session. Per House Bill 2384 and Senate Bill 1295, nicotine and vapor products will be added to the list of prohibited substances in the Rules and Regulations section of the Code of Behavior. On April 26, 2019, the Virginia Board of Education approved the newly revised model guidance for positive preventive code of student conduct policy and alternatives to suspension. The document serves as a blueprint for local school boards and provides multiple resources to assist school divisions in the revision of local policies regarding student discipline. The model guidance document represents a significant shift in focus to a positive and preventative approach to student discipline that promotes a positive school climate, supports equity, fairness, and continuous improvement. 
The model guidance provides a level system of disciplinary responses and instructional interventions for elementary and secondary students and requires school divisions to design an equitable process for managing student behavior based on the behavior descriptors listed. Additionally, the model guidance will require schools to review school-based discipline practices for equity and consistency. VDOE will work with stakeholders to provide professional development, realign data collection and analysis, and provide support for implementation. Additionally, the document will be reviewed annually to include new legislation. OSMAP procedural changes as a result of the 2019 General Assembly action include House Bill 1720 and six, Senate Bill 1632 prohibiting suspension and expulsion for any student who holds a valid written certification for use of cannabidiol oil, oil or THC a oil issued by a practitioner. Additionally, House Bill 1787 and Senate Bill 1381 added a threat to the list of criminal offenses for reassignment and long-term suspension or expulsion for adjudication pertaining to a charge. It is very important that our students feel that their voice is heard and that their learning experience is nurturing, positive, and safe. It was a pleasure for me to meet recently with Saison and student leaders Gabby and Cedric. Together, we decided that students will continue to collaborate with their school administrators to share dress code concerns and ways to ensure consistency and equitable enforcement of the dress code throughout Prince William County Public Schools. Additionally, the Office of Student Services, the Office of Accountability, and the OSMAP Office will continue to work together for ongoing conversations with principals to develop consensus on common dress code practices and align dress code practices across schools at the same level. Now, I'm really sorry that Saison and Annabelle and Wilfredo are not here, but they should probably be listening and they let me know that they will be listening. So we would certainly like to thank them. And I, I fully expect them to be listening and watching, <laughs> taking notes and sending us a book report on it. Yes. And the graduating SCA presidents for their work this year, and we wish them the very best in their future endeavors. And Dara and I have had the opportunity to meet with them and to talk with them, so we believe that now we have a wonderful relationship with what we will do moving forward with their concerns about the dress code. But because our chairman at large expects them to be listening and to give a book report, i like you to, I, Please join Dara and me in congratulating these wonderful students on a job well done, and we hope that they're listening. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Uh, Williams of the Woodbridge District. Um, first, I'd like to say, um, Ms. Custard, I am so sad that you are retiring while I am sitting up here or any other future board because you are such an asset to our school division and your patience and grace and ability to really truly actively listen is a skill that is unmatched, especially in what you do. Your Lee, you led the charge in bringing students in before we had students on the board to participate in, in the code of behavior. The amount of effort that you put in, I know, because I'm negligent every year, I'm usually running to you like, did you guys meet yet? I have so many ideas. You're like, every year, Miss Williams, it's okay, just you know, send me an email and I'll help, and I never do, and you're just always oh, so nice to me still. It's just, I, God bless you. It, I, I will very deeply miss you, and I know that our students and our school community will, but I, I know for sure our student body will miss you. There is nothing like when you're a student having a person in authority not just hear you, 
but listen to you and respect you as an individual. And you do that flawlessly for our kids. And I, I congratulate you on your retirement. I'm sad, but I'm, I'm happy you get to do something else in your life. That's Thank wonderful. Thank you very much, ma'am. You're welcome. Okay, so, you know, I have some questions. Okay. Um, first, I noticed um, in we're updating our policy for nicotine and vapor products. Could we make a distinction um, that it's nicotine vapor and vapor products? Because there are vapor pens out there that contain uh, other substances that are not nicotine-based. And I just graduated a strategic loophole finder. <laughs> so I learned that as a parent, if it's not specifically, you will have a student that says, but you said nicotine. This is like B12, or I'm just vaping like air freshener. You know, so just to kind of get that out of the way. Um, and then could we have a better definition of what a threat is? And then when we define that, can we make sure all of our staff really understand? I think the challenge in the system that we have so large, and especially being site-based, I loved hearing about um, the professional development that's coming on, is it's so widely varied on what one principal perceives as a threat versus another principal perceiving on a threat. But that has a... a huge impact on our student body. Um, when I was going through some of these things, I noticed that there was a chart that outlined different um, things that you could get in trouble for. Uh, I found it very confusing. So I could only imagine, um, as we talk about tier discipline, um, and Ms. Goss will tell you I'm famous for like, can we do a version for dummies? You know, like they have English for dummies and algebra for dummies. And I don't mean that in an insulting way, but I mean that because we do really have so many parents that either rely on their students to interpret school material to them, or, um, you know, it, it words can mean very different things, the same word, to different people. So just a little bit more clarity as we go down this, this road, I think would be very helpful. Um, you know, I just recently heard of a student who was like suspended for five days for an altercation. And I was like, oh, you got in a fight. And he was like, no, nah, it was words. And I was like, what, we, what, word? So these are things that, if I'm confused, I'm sure there are other people confused, and I don't say that to say that you're doing a bad job because I have no way at all, shape, or form, do I mean that. Just like the planning department, I thank God that you are here and that I don't have that job and that you're so wonderful on it. But I think that as we um, students are taking a larger active role, they are doing a good job of self-policing as well. And... Um, I think it's good that we bring the parents and the people who are responsible for them into that fold in a manner that's easy for them to understand as well. Um, and I would be more excited, not tonight, because um, it's late, to hear more about what we're talking about with, with regards to dress code and how we're going to implement that down, um, because it's a very big deal in my district. Um, I remember when Fred Lynn went from uniforms to regular um, wear what you want to wear to school, and it had a major impact on some of our young ladies' self-esteem. Um, I remember parents coming in going, I only bought leggings because that's all I could afford um, for my student. And depending on what your student looked like, that may or may not look appropriate to whoever was looking at them, which is a big deal because it may have looked appropriate to mom, but the principal might not have thought so, and, and those kind of things. So... Um, I have a senior that graduated, so I could take calls. I'm happy to help now. Um, but I, 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 discipline is a really big deal for me, and I, and I am so thankful that we've had Dr. Waltz, who's led the charge over the past um, years that he's been in office. I can say that I'm proud that we, I live in a, in a community and a school division that the rest of the state has modeled their discipline programs after. I think we don't say that enough. We look at other counties, especially when we go to VSBA and NSBA, and they say, oh, we have wraparound programs, or we're bringing in social services. And I go to a, a, a seminar, and I'm like, yes, I'm going to learn something new. And I'm like, wait, we, dang, we've been doing that for like five years. So I, I don't think we tell our own horn enough when it comes to that. I think Virginia is one of those states that you hear about the school-to-prison pipeline, and, and we don't say enough how much we take students out of that. 
and how we continue to educate them, even after they get in trouble and all of the wonderful things that we do. And I just view each year as a, a way that we continue to add another layer on. Nothing is perfect because we're all, this is a perspective business because we're all human. Uh, but I just want to congratulate you on your continued success and, and, again, the way that you value students and how they see their world and how education has become more of an important thing to, to them versus what they wear, what they drive to school, and how they communicate. And I very much respect you on that. But yes, further updates will be wonderful. And I'm definitely interested to see how, as site-based management, we intend to roll this out um, to our, our staff so that everyone is on equal footing. Thank you. Any other thoughts? Come oh, Mr. Deutsch. Uh, I'm going to concur with the comments that were just said about vaping. Uh, whatever we can do to make sure it doesn't happen at all in schools is awesome. <laughs> Mrs. Jesse. Uh, Ms. Jesse. Uh, I didn't hear anything you said in this report. I'm sure it was wonderful. <laughs> I did hear that you were retiring. <laughs> and so after that, everything became a fog. Uh, whatever you said tonight, I'm sure it was wonderful. And I agree with everything that you said. I don't agree with you retiring because you didn't come to me. <laughs> so I don't like surprises. But anyway, I'm done. All right. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Wilk. <laughs> Mr. Wilk, congratulations on your retirement. I would concur with everything Ms. Williams said, but it reminded me of going through the maze of like The Shining or something. I don't know. It was, it was all over. But I caught some of it, so it was very good. Um, but uh, the bullying um, from the proposed language, um, I'm going to still say this, I don't think it goes far enough on, um, uh, you know, it says the students should immediately report all incidences filling out this form. I, I, I look at it again, if you have a student who's traumatized and does not feel empowered enough to fill out the form, what is the obligation of a staff member or someone else to fill out the form for them? So I don't think there's any enough specifics outlining those scenarios that do exist. I know it says a kid should not feel free, you know, feel uh, any type of retaliation or something like that. So I would like to see some type of language uh, or something in there where it also puts some of the onus or responsibility on people who might witness it outside of the student as well. And, and thank you, sir. And we can go back and make sure we add that language to it and make it uh, much clearer clarification for students and for their parents also. Miss Ralston of the Neabsco District. <laughs> wow, <laughs> that sounds good. She's radio voice. <laughs> she rises. Um, I want to thank you. Um, my first day in this position, I talked to you and you told me so much. And I thought about it when I left. That was a lot. And then I said, nah, that's because she knows all this stuff. So you take all your stuff, and I'm sure you're going to come back at least a few times to help out. That's appreciated. Yes. Very much so. But I, I say thank you. Have a wonderful life away from here. <laughs> Take care. Thank you, ma'am. Outstanding. Thank you. Thank you. I think we're... Oh, Dr. Waltz. Congratulations, Carolyn. Thank you. We've sir. already had our words together. Yes, we did. I'll just <laughs> leave it at that. share them. Yes, thank you. Uh, appreciate your work on the code of behavior and I just wanted to uh, mention to the school board that the dress code will continue to evolve as we continue to put more of an effort on the academic accomplishments and a little less on uh, the width of the straps and so forth. Outstanding sir. Okay we are going to move on next to superintendents. T oh no I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> Career and Technical Education Advisory Council Superintendent Appointees, Rita Goss. Um, no, 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 just Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Yeah, uh, yeah, Mr. Deutsch. I move that the Princeton County School Board approve the oh. appointment and reappointment of individuals to the Sorry. Technical Education Advisory <laughs> Committee for a two-year term effective July 1, 2019 through June 30th, uh, 2021. Mr. Chairman. Ms. Williams. I second. We have a second. Um, 
Uh, any uh, any discussion? All in favor? We have to. She does the vote. Oh, we're still doing that. Yeah, yeah. I like the other way. <laughs> it's a lot faster. Okay, here we go. Yes. Superintendent's time. Thank, Thank you. Waltz. It's been busy. Had the pleasure of attending more than 35 events in addition to the graduations during the last three weeks. I'm amazed by the talent of our students and staff and I'm proud to lead this outstanding school division. I attended several athletic events, musicals, spring choir and orchestra concerts, comedy presentations, the student leadership conference, senior picnics, band battles and fundraisers to prevent suicide and help the homeless, just to name a few of them. One of the family and consumer sciences classes made me a delicious lunch. I danced the Macarena, played a goat in a skit, and jumped out of a Viking costume. We also officially broke ground on our 13th high school located near Jiffy Lube Live. If you follow me at Super PWCS, you can see all these uh, pictures of all these great events and the students who were in them. In the past few days, I've also had the pleasure of congratulating our graduates with many of the board members. Thank you so much. The, there were a lot of board members who came out and we really appreciate that. Um, I attended the graduations of the Governor School, Colgan, Forest Park, Freedom, Garfield, Hilton, Osborne Park, Potomac, Stonewall Jackson, Woodbridge, Patriot, and Battlefield High Schools. The only school I couldn't get to was uh, uh, Brentsville because it was the exact same time and I was all, all the way at the arena. So I did go to it last year and it'll be number one on the list next year. Uh, I attended the, uh, by the way, the Battlefield graduation today, hence the purple tie. I did wear the red tie given to me by PWEA um, to the Garfield graduation, which is red. Congratulations to, oh yeah, we're already tonight almost, aren't we? Congratulations to the class of 2019 and thank you to the teachers and staff members as well as the family members. You help support our students throughout the years. I am hopeful that our graduates will follow their dreams and also show kindness towards each other each and every day. I'd also like to congratulate Neil Beach, principal of Osborne Park High School. He was named the principal of the year by the Virginia Association of School Librarians. Mr. Beach was nominated by OPHS librarians Jennifer Coleman and Retha Lawler. Both librarians cited support uh, they said that uh, the support Beach had demonstrated of expanding the traditional views of a library into a hub of activity. And speaking of OP, the musical The Addams Family, which I attended recently, was nominated for five Cappy Awards. Ava Foster and Nathan Rankin won Cappies for Best Hair and Makeup. Chairman Dr. Latif also presented an award for Best Set at the event which is a student program in which students are trained as critics, attend shows at other schools, write and publish reviews in local newspapers. Good job. Benton Middle School teacher Ann Walker, who teaches seventh grade history and social science, has been awarded the James Madison Fellowship for Virginia, a prestigious award earned by one teacher from each state, one from Virginia. The award supports the graduate study of American history by aspiring and experienced secondary school teachers of American history, American government, and civics. Congratulations, Mrs. Walker. Forest Park High School has been named a safe sports school first team by the National Athletic Trainers Association. Forest Park is the first school in Prince William County to receive this award. NATA said the award recognizes Forest Park High School's efforts and positions the school as a leader in sports safety and a community concern with its student athletes and their care. 15 schools in Prince William County earned the 2019 Virginia Index of Performance Awards for Advanced Student Learning and Achievement. Only 270 schools and nine school divisions out of the entire state earned one of those awards. The VIP program recognizes schools and divisions that exceed state and federal accountability standards and achieve excellence goals established by the governor and the Board of Education. Battlefield High School, Patriot, Mary G. Porter Traditional School, and Pennington were recognized with 2019 Board of Education Excellence Awards. 
only 90 schools in the entire state of Virginia won this award. These schools also met all the state and federal accountability benchmarks and made significant progress towards goals for increased student achievement and expanded educational opportunities set forth by the State Board of Education. Alvey, Ashland, Cedar Point, Glenkirk, Marshall, Miniville, Mountain View, and T. Clay Wood Elementary Schools, the Noakesville School, the Gainesville and Reagan Middle Schools earned the Distinguished Achievement Award. Only 175 schools in the state of Virginia earned this award. Congratulations to these schools, their teachers and staff, and the students and their families for this outstanding accomplishment. One final little thing, this graduating class was the first class that every student was afforded full day kindergarten. I'm a little emotional about this. Uh, I had a teacher who posted today, um, and basically what she said was she wanted to remind me, again, we had the battlefield commencement today, that when she was a first year teacher, which would have been 14 years ago, I read Curious George's first day of school. And she said, and you spoke to them on their last. Pretty cool. That's it. Revision of policy 303 cash receipts. Uh, Mr. Wallingford. You know, um, you got 30 seconds, <laughs> and go if there's a question, we'll email it to you. So, Dr. Latif, Dr. Waltz, members of the board, very briefly, policy 303 is being changed simply to simplify it and change the, res the person who's responsible, uh, the director of, uh, excuse me, the associate superintendent of finance and risk management, because of the implementation of SAFES and um, Armored Corps service over the past two years, um, we can make this policy much simpler. Thank you. Thank you. You will get emailed questions. Very good. Report on the school board um, CIP Joint Committee, Ms. Williams. Thank you. Just to keep it brief, uh, the Joint CIP Committee met. Uh, we voted on a resolution to recommend that each, because we have no authority to direct, um, that each uh, board now take undertake the discussions of funding the trailer reduction plan uh, that was recommended at our last joint meeting. And um, I am just here officially to ask our school board to consider discussions for funding as the time progresses and hopefully maybe by the fall, we ourselves can have some recommendations to the County Board of Supervisors or a plan of action to further along this discussion. Thank you, Ms. Williams. Mr. Deutsch. Thank you, um, one question. Uh, I think back in November, December, when we had the joint meeting, we discussed an audit of the uh, projection numbers. Where is that audit? What's the timeline on that? When are we getting it? It's uh, yet to be completed, and it was um, not a factor in the discussion, uh, unless you ask Ms. Anderson. Yeah, but do, do we have a timeline when it would be finished by? Mr. Trenum. I think at the last meeting they said we should see results coming in the August-September time frame, which from a budget perspective doesn't affect us for, yeah. no. for anything. Excellent. Thank you, Ms. Williams, Ms. Trenum, Ms. William, um, and Jesse, for um, your continued support of that effort. Um, next, we will go to board matters. Um, we will start with Mr. Deutsch. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll be brief. Uh, we've had a lot of graduations, uh, award ceremonies, end of the year things, a lot of exciting things. Uh, and congratulations to all the students. Uh, your uh, hard work is uh, paying off. Uh, we've seen some incredible uh, scholarship awards. Uh, we had the Career and Technical Education Signing Day. Uh, we had the JROTC uh, leadership event. And so a lot of just great opportunities that students are taking advantage of um, and uh, as they move forward. So congratulations to everyone. Uh, also, uh, definitely want to congratulate uh, Neil Beach for his accomplishment and his award. Uh, he is an incredible uh, principal and uh, 
always great to see that recognized. Uh, one, one last thing, and uh, one sp a lot of special events, but one event to really highlight, uh, Hilton High School, uh, we had the automobile uh, program. Uh, Ed Stevens, um, yeah, we all had fun there, right? Uh, so that was their, that was their, automobile, uh, their automobile program, end of year award ceremony. Uh, Ed Stevens is a fascinating, humorous, funny guy. Uh, who pours into his students and gets incredible results. And just seeing uh, 15, 20 years worth of former students come back to that event uh, and their involvement in that program, uh, helping out with um, you know, getting supplies to them, different sponsorships, um, it's, it's really a, a legacy and a community involvement, and it was, it was exciting. Uh, we also, uh, one of their big projects was a total refurbishment on a Jeep. And that thing was gorgeous. Uh, and Dr. Waltz and I got to sit in it, um, take pictures with it, but every bit of that thing was tricked out. And uh, they're going for uh, a big uh, national contest with it. It's going to be auctioned up, competing against uh, other schools, and uh, will be really cool. Ms. Williams. Uh, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to um, take the time to congratulate uh, my son uh, was part of, well, of course him because I'm his mom, but, um, you know, I remember when Dr. Waltz first came to the county, I remember standing on the steps of Rockledge and uh, meeting him, my mother grilling you and relentlessly about how you managed to make it to all of these schools. But it, it's an honor to be a parent of a graduate. Um, it, and to have so many of the children that he started with graduating. And not only are they graduating from Potomac, but they're graduating from Garfield, they're graduating from Woodbridge, they're graduating from Hilton. They're gra I mean, I went to a lot of graduations, not as a board member, uh, well, as a board member, but additionally as the mom of Lee's friend to support them and to hear about the students graduating with 4.7s and, and the amount of scholarship dollars. I mean, schools that, um, it's just absolutely amazing that the diversity of programs that we have and how students take advantage of them. Um, not just one program, but multiple programs. Students graduating with cords and buttons and ribbons. I mean, it's just amazing. Um, and, I, and I would be remiss if I didn't bring special attention to the fact that we have an outstanding first graduation from Independence Non-Traditional School tomorrow, which has historically been the highlight of my year. Um, and I also know a student graduating from there. So I can't wait, well, later on today, I can't wait to uh, be there for that. Um, I just want to remind parents again, as I sit here and say this, that our students are resilient, they are amazing, and they are awesome. And it is always a scary thing when your student progresses from one grade level to another, but I can tell you living, breathing, it, it, they, they work it out. Technology is amazing. And we, as a school system, I think just don't do them. We can't, we can't boast about their achievements enough. And I think it would be really nice if some of our papers got on the board. I'm still looking for that CTE announcement from some of our local newspapers because I watched those CTE kids graduate and they were so proud of themselves and they're going off to make major contributions in our society. And I just can't wait till Independence is great graduation later on today. Thank you. Ms. Jesse. Um, I went to several graduations. I'm not going to list them all, but um, I just want to congratulate the reader of the names. Oh my, oh. <laughs> oh my gosh. I, I just don't know how they do it, but they are amazing. And I also want to graduate, congratulate the young man who flipped off the stage and actually, okay, yes, yes no. aced the landing. We're not encouraging. We're not encouraging it, but no, it, but it was, it was awesome. It was awesome. It happened so quickly, I barely saw it. But anyway, um, I, I have one more graduation that I never miss, and that is the traditional school. Uh, and I'm looking forward to that. But other than that, I'm out. We have a gentleman rocking at the end of this. This, yeah, Miss Diane Ralston. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I attended graduations. Uh, Garfield, of course, that's in my, you know, my personal district, not just everybody else's district. Uh, very grateful to 
everyone who comes out to be a part of this. Um, it's a great thing to see the parents, how happy they are and, you know, gleeful. If, when you fill up that much of, a, of a, uh, a place, you know, you know you love what your children are standing for at that moment. And so that was Garfield and um, Hilton. And uh, you got to remember that there's other grades other than high school. So um, Bevel Middle School had some wonderful smart kids coming out of there. So we had something to look forward to as they go on to uh, high school. And then we have the other children, the little bitty ones, the fifth graders who are moving up. They're stepping up at, um, <clears throat> excuse me, they're, they're going to step up tomorrow right at Miniville. So if you want a hot dog or a hamburger, come on over because they're going to treat anybody that walks in. Uh, yeah, it's not biggie. I like that too. I don't have to worry about much of anything. Um, I just want to say that it's been a great year. Um, I think that we have uh, done some great things. So I thank the staff for this year. I appreciate the things that you do, even if I don't say it all the time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Olson. Mr. Trenum. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll be uh, very quick. I just want to uh, congratulate uh, the graduations I was able, the students at the graduations I was able to attend. Um, see, that was Brentsville, Potomac, Stonewall Jackson, uh, Patriot, and Battlefield. Um, and then uh, we've got fifth grade graduations coming up over the next week, so we'll, we'll hit a few of those as well. I don't know off the top of my head, but congratulations, everybody. It's almost done. Ms. Satterwhite. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So as I mentioned earlier tonight, we've been busy as board members. Um, before I say that, though, I do want to thank the Hilton Cabinet Making. They gave each one of us this lovely tray. It's absolutely beautiful, and it has Hilton Cabinet Making on the back. So thank you so much for making those for us. That's a really special gift. And then um, I was able to attend 13 senior ceremonies and graduations. Brentsville District High School in Colgan, I was there last year to see you guys. I'll try and get back again later. Um, it was an honor to speak at Pace West Senior Ceremony. Also attended the Hilton Battlefield High School and Garfield Senior Awards. And that Garfield Senior Awards, my goodness, Ms. Ralston, um, as the principal said, he went in expecting an award ceremony, and it was an award ceremony, pep rally, and birthday party. So we had a good time there. Um, the Governor's School Senior Symposium um, was absolutely phenomenal with our Governor's School's projects. Um, the baccalaureate, there's a baccalaureate for several of our schools in Western Prince William County hosted by Park Valley Church, and thank you for everyone involved with that. That was a very special event for our families. I um, also attended Motown. Thank you, Dr. Waltz, for um, seeing our students um, at Battlefield High School Choirs with their amazing presentation. This morning, I was at Mountain View for a Military Heroes Breakfast honoring our st students, or yesterday morning, I'm sorry, honoring our students. And then also yesterday was the Seniors Grad Walk at uh, Mountain View Elementary School, and our Cougars sang their song from elementary school. It seemed like there were 100 um, students there who were graduates. Um, we had the groundbreaking of the 13th High School, and I have to say I was just about giddy that day because it's happening, and there's actual construction going on. And I want to thank our construction, our facilities, for letting things be a little quiet on Monday and today as we had graduations because you can hear that work pretty well from Jiffy Lube. So thank you to everybody for helping us with that. Um, as was mentioned, we had our CTE signing day. And I want to give a shout out to Joshua Jurek, who is one of our extraordinary teens. Um, I first met him at church in middle school. And uh, we're together in the School Health Advisory Board. And, and all of these teens are amazing. But Joshua um, has more abilities that outweigh his disabilities. And I want to thank him for all the leadership that he's shown in Prince William County Schools and wish him all the best. I believe he's going to JMU next year. Um, there were some common themes in our um, graduation speeches that were absolutely outstanding by our students. And then Dr. Waltz also spoke of kindness. Um, kindness, love, and hope were themes that we kept hearing again and again. And to all of our graduates, I wish you great success, congratulate you on your academic success, and I hope that you'll carry those words, kindness, love, and hope with you, not only the words, but also actions, and we wish you all the best. All right, good evening. 
Sorry for missing the meeting earlier. As I said, I was at the Benton Awards ceremony. Oh, did I miss somebody? Oh, yeah, my, sorry, Mr. Wilk. I'm the best looking one up here. Um, um, <laughs> just for you, now I'm going to read all my events. Um, <laughs> no, there were a bunch of events. I um, just want to write a couple of ones. We, of course, Gil and a couple of people have alluded to the fifth grade promotion nights. I was at one right before here at Henderson, Montclair last night, and then uh, one every night now until about Tuesday night next week. Um, had the pleasure of attending, of course, the two high schools in my district, Potomac and Forest Park's graduation ceremonies. Uh, and also visited Forest Park for their senior awards banquet, uh, along with uh, Potomac Senior Picnic. I want to recognize Mike Wright, uh, the principal there who is retiring, has done a great job. Uh, many years commuting quite a while from home uh, to be the principal and be a steady hand at that building. We'll miss uh, Principal Wright uh, at Potomac High School. Um, a couple other events, visited a number of other schools. D -d 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 -d. Had a real good time. Uh, Ms. Covington and I uh, went back to Dumfries Elementary together. It's been a while since she's gone in the building and we went around, she talked to kids, went to the library, visited, had some great conversations. So that was special. Um, also, um, Ashland Military Family Picnic. It was uh, the last event of the year for the Military Family Committee. I want to thank Courtney Powers uh, and the military liaison at that school. And finally, my biggest accomplishment, I would say, it's been 17 years uh, since I ran any type of race. Um, but one of the speakers tonight mentioned she saw me at a race, but I actually ran um, in the 5K and actually had a decent time. Um, I ran with one of more, our more uh, senior elderly members of staff. Um, he helped guide me through. <laughs> he knows who he is. To, to, his, to his credit, to his credit, I, I will say this, to his credit, he, he runs, oh no, he runs like four or five miles a day. I like had two weeks of maybe sporadically running and pre prepping for this. So he, no, no, well, he graciously at the end let me run ahead of him. And you, there's a photo finish at the end and you see me hightailing it and he's in the back. That's because you're his boss. <laughs> 4.8%. But in another angle, I was showing my wife, I was so proud, another person sent me a photo and my wife's like, yeah, but you're like, isn't that that one guy's like fifth grade son that you're racing? <laughs> so, you know, it was a good event, but uh, it, was, uh, it was fun. Uh, so the Henderson 5K, looking forward to doing in the future and running with uh, my friend again. So thank you. <laughs> I don't think he's your friend anymore. He's not your friend. That's your last he, was your friend. <laughs> he was your friend. <laughs> All right, good evening again. Thank you, everyone, for, um, you know, fortunately, we don't have these kind of long meetings very often anymore. I did want everyone to earn their, earn their raise, I guess. Um, I went to eight commencements, enjoyed all of them. I'm going to read you a few of the statements from our fantastic future leaders of this country. Um, I don't have their names, and I, I wrote down some of their, their lovely comments from their speeches. Do not echo the voices of others. Reshape the conversations as your own. Today, we become accountable to the world. We are from seven continents. We are the face of the American future. Thrust into the puzzle of life. Let us find the pieces to put them together. Never lose hope. When you think back, it'll be the friends and the teachers that left the impact on you, not the numbers and the scores. You are never too old to set a new goal or have a new dream. We don't want you to be bystanders. We want you to be leaders. From a couple principles, um, Dr. Bishop, as one, we will succeed if we work as one. From Doc, uh, Mr. Ferreira, how you define your success is your choice. I am a successful man, not because of some numbers, but because of my hard work and resilience. Find your individual passion, be brave. Today, uh, I think it was today, um, today? Yeah. Kurt Boyd, yes. Kurt Boyd was today, and you know, he, he was the president of the Student Council Association of Battlefield, and he said, you know, when I was putting the speeches together, I, should I watch the ones on YouTube and old ones? 
And then he said, no, I'm not going to do that because he said, my speech must be original and special because each one of you is original and special. So thank you, Kurt Boyd. Thank you to all your great students out there. I can't be more proud of being chairman of, I believe, one of the greatest school systems on the planet. Uh, we have our challenges, um, but we have done some amazing work. I think Dr. Waltz, the idea that this is the first graduating class that took full day kindergarten, I think that is incredible. There's a lot of research and science that says that is important. Imagine what we can do when we give universal pre-K to our students, um, universal pre-pre-K. I think there is uh, an incredible opportunity for this nation to adopt that idea and truly run with it. Um, I can't thank you all enough to our students, to their parents, to the teachers and staff. Um, the fruits of your labor were on display over the last two weeks and just absolutely beautiful. Congratulations, Prince William County. Congratulations, Prince William County graduates of 2019. I hope you all have a wonderful and successful future. Thank you. Have a great night. Meeting adjourned.